share, subscribe, like, comment. Ravi was a bright student studying accountancy. His passion for numbers and financial analysis was evident, but he often found it difficult to grasp how the technical details of accounting standards could be applied in the real world. One day, his professor, a well-known chartered accountant who had a reputation for making complex topics relatable through storytelling, decided to help Ravi understand INDAS-1, the standard that deals with the presentation of financial statements. The professor began with a story. Ravi, let me tell you about a company called R of Enterprises, which was once in a situation where it had to present its financial statements clearly. This was a medium-sized manufacturing company, and they were doing well. However, when they expanded, they needed to attract more investors. Investors, as you can imagine, want to see how well a company is performing before they put their money into it. R of Enterprises had all the numbers in place, but they struggled to communicate these numbers effectively. That's where INDAS-1 comes in. Ravi listened attentively, intrigued by the real-world example. You see, Ravi, the professor continued, INDAS-1 helps companies like R of Enterprises organize their financial information in a way that anyone reading the financial statements can clearly understand the financial health of the company. It provides a structure. Think of it like organizing your study notes before an exam. If your notes are all over the place, you might know the material, but you'll have a hard time revising efficiently. Similarly, a company might have all the correct financial data, but if it's not presented well, Investors and stakeholders may not understand it. Ravi nodded, beginning to see the connection. Now let me tell you about how R of Enterprises used this standard. They followed the guidelines in INDAS-1, and they prepared their financial statements, ensuring that their balance sheet, profit and loss statement, and cash flow statement were clearly laid out. They grouped their assets, liabilities, and equity separately, as the standard requires. And they also provided clear notes to the accounts explaining the details behind certain figures. This transparency helped potential investors understand the company's financial position without confusion. The professor paused, giving Ravi a moment to absorb the information before continuing with another case. There was another company, let's call it Sunil Textiles, which learned this lesson the hard way. They used to present their financials in a very disorganized manner. Their statements did not distinguish clearly between current and non-current liabilities. There was no proper classification of their expenses, and their financial statements were difficult to read. As a result, investors were hesitant, even though the company was doing reasonably well. Robbie raised a question. So, Professor, is INDAS-1 only about formatting? The professor smiled. Good question, Robbie. It's not just about formatting, it's about ensuring clarity consistency, and transparency. For example, INDAS-1 requires that financial statements should be prepared on an accrual basis and that there should be consistency from one period to the next. This allows stakeholders to compare the company's financial performance over time. R of Enterprises followed these principles, which gave them an edge. Their financial statements showed a true and fair view of the company's position. Investors were confident that the company was being transparent and that's what convinced them to invest. Ravi nodded, now understanding that the presentation of financial statements was much more than just arranging numbers. It was about conveying the right information clearly to all stakeholders. The professor had effectively used real-life examples to explain the importance and application of INDAS-1, and Ravi felt much more confident in his understanding. Remember, Ravi, the professor concluded, financial statements are not just for accountants. They are meant for investors, regulators, and anyone who has an interest in the financial well-being of the company. INDAS-1 ensures that these statements are understandable and useful for everyone. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One sunny afternoon, Ravi sat in his accounting class, eager to learn more about the technicalities of accounting standards. His professor, a renowned chartered accountant famous for weaving stories into his lessons, was about to introduce INDAS-2, the standard dealing with inventories. Robbie was curious. He knew inventories were crucial for any business, but he wasn't sure how this standard played a role in real life. The professor noticed Robbie's curiosity and smiled. He began, Ravi, let me tell you about a company called Sharma and Sons, a family-owned business that manufactures electronic gadgets. The company had a wide range of products in its warehouse, finished goods, 
raw materials, and items that were still in production. These are all part of what we call inventory. Sharma and Sons faced a challenge. How should they measure and present these inventories in their financial statements? That's where INAS2 came into the picture. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued by the story. The professor continued, Sharma and Sons, like many businesses, needed to make sure their inventory was valued correctly. You see, Ravi, inventory isn't just about counting the stock. It's about valuing it properly. If you overvalue your inventory, your profits will look inflated. If you undervalue it, your financial health will seem weaker than it actually is. This can mislead investors, creditors, and even the company's management. To make things clearer, the professor introduced a real-life scenario. Take the case of a similar business, Patel Textiles, a large supplier of fabrics. A few years ago, Patel Textiles got into trouble because they didn't follow the guidelines set by INDAS2. They valued their inventory at the selling price, thinking it would make their financial position look better. But they forgot that the standard requires inventory to be valued at the lower of cost and net realizable value. When the auditors reviewed their financial statements, they found that Patel Textiles had overvalued their stock by a significant amount. As a result, the company had to revise its financial statements, which led to a loss of investor trust. Ravi listened carefully, beginning to understand how important the valuation of inventory could be. The professor then shifted back to Sharma and Sons. Sharma and Sons learned from mistakes like this and made sure to follow INDAS too strictly. They calculated the cost of their inventory based on their purchase price, including any costs of bringing the inventory to its present location and condition. When they realized that some of their older gadgets weren't selling, they checked the net realizable value, which is the estimated selling price minus the cost to sell. Since the net realizable value was lower than the cost, they valued those items accordingly. This ensured that their financial statements reflected the actual worth of their inventory. Ravi raised a question, but Professor, how does a company decide which method to use for valuing inventory? I've heard of terms like FIFO and weighted average cost. The professor smiled, glad to see Ravi's engagement. Good question, Ravi. INDAS2 gives companies the option to use methods like FIFO, first in, first out, or the weighted average cost method. Sharma and Sons, for example, used the FIFO method because they wanted to match the cost of their older inventory with the sales they were making first. This made sense for their business where older models of gadgets are sold first before the new ones. Other companies might choose the weighted average method if it suits their business operations better. The professor then shared another case study. Another company, Meta Pharmaceuticals, dealt with fast-moving goods. They used the weighted average cost method because they purchased raw materials in large quantities, often at fluctuating prices. By using the weighted average, they were able to smooth out the cost variations over time. This helped them avoid significant swings in their reported profits. Both methods are allowed under INDAS2, but the key is to apply whichever method the company chooses consistently. Ravi was starting to piece things together. He realized that INDAS2 wasn't just a dry set of rules, but a practical guideline that helped companies present a true and fair view of their inventories in their financial statements. The professor concluded, Ravi, Inventory is often one of the largest assets on a company's balance sheet, and how it is valued can have a big impact on the financials. INDAS2 ensures that companies value their inventories accurately, using consistent methods, and that they reflect the actual costs or realizable value. This builds trust with stakeholders and provides a clear picture of the company's financial health. Ravi smiled, now confident that he could understand and explain the importance of INDAS2 in valuing inventories. The professor's storytelling had, once again, brought the standard to life in a way that made perfect sense to him. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One day, Ravi walked into his accounting class feeling puzzled about a new topic he had come across in his textbooks, INDAS7, the standard that deals with the statement of cash flows. Although he had studied the basics of cash flow statements, he found it hard to understand how this standard applied in the real world. His professor, a well-known chartered accountant with a knack for storytelling, noticed Ravi's confusion and decided to explain the concept through a real-life case. 
Ravi, the professor began, I see you're trying to figure out the importance of Andy AS7. Let me tell you the story of Kieran Automobiles, a car manufacturing company. Like any business, Kieran Automobiles made money from its operations, selling cars, spare parts, and providing after-sales services. They had a solid revenue stream, but one day, they hit a rough patch. Their sales slowed down, and they needed a bank loan to keep their operations running. The bank asked for their financial statements, including a detailed statement of cash flows. Robbie's curiosity was piqued as the professor continued. Now, Kieran Automobiles had always focused on their profit and loss statement. They thought that as long as they were profitable, they were safe. However, when the bank reviewed their statement of cash flows, they saw something different. Even though the company was showing profits, their cash flow from operations was negative. They were spending more cash than they were bringing in, which was a red flag for the bank. Robbie frowned, trying to understand the difference. The professor smiled and explained. You see, Ravi, the statement of cash flows as required by INDAS 7 breaks down the movement of cash into three main sections. Cash flow from operating activities, cash flow from investing activities, and cash flow from financing activities. This is where it becomes clear how cash is actually moving in and out of the business, something that cannot always be seen in the profit and loss statement. The professor continued with the Kieran Automobiles case. The company had been investing heavily in new equipment and had taken on loans to finance these investments. Because of this, their cash flow from investing activities was highly negative. This is not necessarily a bad thing, as it can show that the company is investing for growth. However, what concerned the bank was that their cash flow from operating activities, essentially the cash generated from day-to-day -day business, was also negative. This meant that the company wasn't bringing in enough cash from selling cars and spare parts to cover their basic expenses. Ravi interrupted. But professor, if they were making a profit, how could their cash flow be negative? The professor nodded. That's a good question, Ravi. This is where understanding IND AS7 becomes important. A company can show profits in its profit and loss statement because it includes non-cash items, like depreciation and amortization. However, the cash flow statement only deals with actual cash movements. In Kieran Automobile's case, they were selling cars on credit, meaning they hadn't yet received cash for many of their sales. While this showed up as revenue in their profit and loss statement, it didn't reflect in their cash flow. At the same time, they were paying cash for raw materials and other operating expenses. This created a mismatch. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. The professor continued. To solve their cash flow problem, Kieran Automobiles had to make changes. They tightened their credit policies and improved their collection of receivables, which helped increase their cash flow from operations. Eventually, the bank approved the loan because they showed a clear plan to manage their cash better. Ravi, now intrigued, asked, Is this what happened to every company struggling with cash flow? The professor smiled and shared another case. Not exactly. Let me tell you about Ravi Pharmaceuticals, a company that followed IND AS7 very carefully. They were profitable and also had a positive cash flow from operations. However, their cash flow from financing activities was negative because they had repaid a large part of their debt. This might have seemed worrying at first glance, but it actually gave investors confidence. Why? Because the company was using its profits to reduce debt showing that they had strong cash flow from their core business and were managing their finance as well. Robbie nodded in understanding, seeing the significance of tracking cash flows separately from profits. The professor concluded, Ravi, the statement of cash flows, as per INDAS 7, tells you how healthy a company's cash management is. It shows how much cash is coming from operations, how much is being invested in growth, and how much is being borrowed or repaid. This is crucial for banks, investors, and even the company's management to understand whether they have enough cash to run their day-to-day -day activities. Always remember, profits do not always equal cash, and INDAS7 helps ensure transparency by showing where the cash is really going. Robbie left the class that day with a clear understanding of the application of INDAS7. The professor's storytelling had once again turned a complex accounting standard into a relatable and real-life concept. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One afternoon, Ravi sat in his accounting class, 
pondering over a new topic, INDAS 8, which deals with accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates, and errors. The concept seemed abstract to him. So his professor, a well-known chartered accountant famous for using real-life stories to explain complex concepts, decided to make the lesson more relatable through storytelling. Ravi, the professor began, let me tell you about a company named Rohit Constructions, a large construction business that had been following a particular accounting policy for years. They recognized their revenue from construction contracts based on the percentage of completion method, where they booked revenue as the work on a project progressed. This policy worked well for them for a long time, and their financial statements always presented a clear picture of their financial position. Ravi leaned in, curious about where this was going. However, the professor continued, one year, Rohit Constructions found that a new accounting standard required them to change how they recognized revenue. The percentage of completion method was no longer acceptable for certain types of contracts. They had to switch to a method where they recognized revenue only when the entire project was completed. Now, this created a challenge for them. Should they just go back and change their old financial statements? Should they continue with the old method for previous contracts and only use the new method for future ones? Ravi was intrigued, so the professor explained further. This is where INDS 8 comes in. INDAS 8 provides guidance on how to handle changes in accounting policies. In this case, since Rohit Constructions had to change their policy due to a new accounting standard, they followed INDAS 8 and applied the new policy retrospectively. This means they went back and adjusted their prior financial statements to reflect the new method of revenue recognition, as if they had always used this method. This ensured that the financial statements were comparable over different periods, which is important for investors and stakeholders. Robbie raised a question, but Professor, what happens if a company changes its accounting policy voluntarily? Do they still have to go back and adjust everything? The professor smiled. Good question, Ravi. If a company changes its accounting policy voluntarily, INDAS 8 requires them to apply the change retrospectively, just like they did when the change was due to a new accounting standard. For example, let's say another company, Sing Textiles, decided to change its inventory valuation method from weighted average cost to the first-in, first-out FIFO method because they believed it would provide a better reflection of their business. In this case, they would go back and adjust their previous financial statements to reflect the new policy. This helps users of the financial statements make meaningful comparisons between different periods. Ravi nodded, understanding the importance of consistency in financial reporting. The professor then shifted the conversation to another aspect of INDAS 8. Let me also tell you about a different scenario when companies need to change their accounting estimates. Take Agarwal Electronics, a company that sells electronic appliances. They estimated the useful life of their machinery to be 10 years and calculated depreciation accordingly. However, after five years, they found that their machinery was wearing out faster than expected. They now needed to adjust the estimated useful life to seven years. Ravi frowned, unsure about how this would be handled. The professor continued, In this case, INDAS 8 allows companies to change accounting estimates prospectively. This means Agarwal Electronics did not need to go back and change the depreciation for the previous five years. Instead, they only applied the new estimate for the remaining two years. Changing an estimate is different from changing an accounting policy. Estimates are based on new information or new developments, and the changes are applied from the point when they become necessary, without adjusting past financial statements. Robbie's eyes lit up with understanding. So, changing estimates is more about looking forward, while changing policies often requires looking back. Exactly, the professor replied, pleased that Ravi was following along. But what happens if a company makes a mistake in their financial statements? Ravi asked. The professor nodded and shared another real-life case. Ah, uh, ew. Let me tell you about Desai Manufacturing, a company that accidentally overstated its revenue by including sales that hadn't actually been completed. This was a material error, meaning it could mislead stakeholders who relied on their financial statements. INDAS 8 provides guidance on how to correct such errors. Desai Manufacturing had to go back and restate their prior period financial statements as if the error had never occurred. This is called retrospective restatement. 
It ensures that users of the financial statements can trust the information presented, knowing that any material errors have been corrected. Robbie thought for a moment and asked, So the goal of INDAS 8 is to ensure that the financial statements are accurate and comparable, even when policies change or mistakes happen? The professor smiled, pleased with Robbie's summary. Exactly, Robbie. INDAS 8 is all about ensuring transparency and consistency in financial reporting. Whether it's a change in accounting policy, a new estimate, or correcting an error, the standard provides clear guidelines on how to handle these situations. By following these principles, companies like Rohit Constructions, Singh Textiles, Agarwal Electronics, and Desai Manufacturing can maintain the trust of their investors, creditors, and other stakeholders. Robbie left the class that day with a deep understanding of INDAS 8, thanks to the professor's storytelling. He now knew that accounting wasn't just about numbers, but also about how those numbers were presented, adjusted, and corrected over time to reflect the true financial health of a company. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One warm afternoon, Robbie sat in his accounting class, flipping through the pages of his textbook. He had just come across INDAS 10, which talked about events after the reporting period. The concept seemed abstract to him. What kind of events could affect financial statements even after the reporting period had ended? Sensing Robbie's confusion, his professor, a chartered accountant known for his engaging storytelling, decided it was time for another real-life case. Ravi, let me tell you about Varma Exports, a company that deals in textiles. They prepare their financial statements every year, just like any other business. Let's say the financial year ends on March 31st. Now, once the year ends, the company has some time to finalize their accounts before presenting them to the shareholders. But what if something important happens after March 31st, before they issue the financial statements? How should that be handled? That's where INDAS 10 comes into play. Ravi, intrigued by the example, asked, What kind of events are we talking about, Professor? The professor smiled. Good question, Ravi. Let's take the case of Varma Exports. On March 31st, they were in good financial shape, and they had already drafted a set of financial statements showing profits. However, just two weeks later, on April 15th, one of their biggest customers, who owed them a large sum of money, declared bankruptcy. Now, that was a significant event. It meant that Varma Exports was unlikely to recover the money owed to them. Under INDAS 10, this is called an adjusting event and it has to be reflected in their financial statements because it provides additional information about a condition that existed on March 31st. Ravi nodded as the concept began to make sense. So even though the bankruptcy happened after the reporting period, the fact that the customer was struggling with financial issues before March 31st makes it an adjusting event. Exactly, Ravi, the professor said. Varma Exports must adjust their financial statements to reflect the fact that they will not be able to collect the money from this customer. They would need to write off or create a provision for the bad debt. This ensures that the financial statements still show a true and fair view of the company's financial position as of March 31st. The professor then shifted to another type of event to help Ravi understand the distinction. Now let me tell you about a different company, Mishra Pharmaceuticals. On March 31st, they finished the year with a healthy balance sheet. A few weeks later in April, they received news that one of their factories had caught fire and was severely damaged. However, unlike the previous example, this is what we call a non-adjusting event under INDAS 10 because it relates to an event that occurred after the reporting period and the condition did not exist on March 31st. Ravi, now curious, asked, so in this case, they don't need to adjust their financial statements? That's right, the professor replied. For non-adjusting events like this, Mishra Pharmaceuticals does not change their financial statements for the year ending March 31st. However, because this is a significant event, they must disclose it in the notes to the financial statements. They would provide details about the fire, the potential losses, and how they plan to handle the situation. This ensures transparency, even though the financial numbers for the reporting period remain the same. Ravi, beginning to see the full picture, asked, so the main point of INDAS 10 is to make sure that financial statements provide relevant information, even after the reporting period, right? The professor nodded, pleased with Ravi's understanding. Exactly, Ravi. 
INDAS 10 ensures that companies either adjust their financial statements or disclose important events that happen after the reporting period, but before the financial statements are issued. This keeps investors and stakeholders informed of any major changes that might affect their decisions. The professor continued with another real-life example. There was once a company called Desai Motors that didn't follow INDAS 10 properly. After their reporting period ended, but before their financial statements were finalized, they lost a major legal case, which resulted in a significant financial liability. However, they didn't disclose this event or adjust their financials, thinking it happened after the reporting period, so it didn't matter. When investors found out later, the company's stock price plummeted, and they lost the trust of their stakeholders. They had failed to recognize that this legal case, although decided after the reporting period, had been ongoing during the year and should have been considered an adjusting event. Robbie leaned back in his chair, thinking deeply. So, it's not just about what happens after the year ends, but also about whether the event relates to conditions that existed during the reporting period. The professor smiled and said, Exactly. INDAS 10 draws a line between adjusting and non-adjusting events, making sure that the financial statements remain reliable. For adjusting events, like the bankruptcy of Varma Exports customer, the financials must be changed. For non-adjusting events, like the fire at Mishra Pharmaceuticals, the company discloses the event, but the numbers stay the same. Robbie now understood the importance of INDAS 10. It wasn't just about closing the books at the end of the year, but about making sure that any significant events, whether adjusting or non-adjusting, were either reflected in or disclosed through the financial statements. Thanks to the professor's storytelling, the standard had come to life for him. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One afternoon, Robbie sat in his accounting class trying to make sense of INDAS 12, which deals with income taxes. The professor, Known for using real-life stories to explain complex topics, noticed Ravi's puzzled look and decided to introduce him to the standard with a story. Ravi, the professor began, let me tell you about a company called Meta Manufacturing. They were doing well in their business of producing steel parts and had been profitable for the past few years. When it came to paying taxes like every other company, they paid based on their taxable profits. However, the year-end financial statements presented a more complex picture. The profits in their financial statements were different from what they had reported for tax purposes. How can this happen? Ravi frowned, wondering how profits could differ between financial statements and tax returns. Let me explain, said the professor. INDAS 12 deals with the differences between accounting profit and taxable profit. These differences arise because the rules for calculating profits in financial statements are different from the rules for calculating profits for tax purposes. Some expenses might be allowed in the financial statements but not deductible for tax, and some income might be taxable in a different year than it appears in the financials. Ravi was intrigued and asked, but how does that affect the financial statements, professor? The professor smiled. Good question, Ravi. This is where INDAS 12 helps. Let me give you an example. Meta Manufacturing invested in a new machine, and for accounting purposes, they depreciated it over 10 years. But for tax purposes, the tax authorities allowed them to claim the entire depreciation over five years. This created a difference between the profit reported in their financial statements and the profit they reported for tax. Robbie was beginning to follow, so the professor continued. Because of this difference, Meta Manufacturing ended up paying less tax in the first few years since their taxable profit was lower. However, in the future, they will have to pay more tax because the depreciation for tax purposes will be finished, but they'll still have depreciation left in their financial statements. INDAS 12 tells us to recognize this difference now, even if the tax will be paid in the future. This is called a deferred tax liability. It's an obligation the company will have to pay in the future and INDAS 12 requires us to reflect it in the financial statements. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. So, even though they're paying less tax now, they need to show that they'll pay more in the future? Exactly, the professor said. And it works the other way, too. Let me tell you about Sharma Pharmaceuticals. They developed a new drug, but the government gave them a tax holiday, meaning they wouldn't have to pay any tax for the first three years. In their financial statements, they showed the profits they earned, 
but for tax purposes, they didn't have to pay anything during the holiday period. However, once the holiday period ended, they would have to start paying tax again. Ravi interrupted. So, well, does that mean they don't have to worry about taxes for three years? The professor smiled. Not exactly, Ravi. INDAS 12 tells us that even though they don't pay tax now, they should recognize what's called a deferred tax asset. This asset represents the benefit they will receive in the future. For example, during the tax holiday, they may not have to pay taxes, but they can carry forward certain losses or deductions to the years when they will have to pay tax. The company must recognize this asset now, so investors and stakeholders can get a clear picture of the future tax benefit. Robbie was starting to see the full picture, but he had another question. So, Professor, how does this deferred tax thing actually help? The professor nodded and said, That's an important question, Robbie. Imagine you're an investor in Sharma Pharmaceuticals. You see that the company isn't paying any tax right now, and you might think that they'll have a big tax burden later. However, by recognizing a deferred tax asset, the company shows that they've planned for the future. They won't suddenly face a huge tax bill because they'll be able to offset it with the deductions or losses they've carried forward. The professor then turned to another real-life case. Now let me tell you about a situation where a company didn't apply INDAS-12 correctly. Kumar Textiles had been using a particular method for valuing their inventory. This method created temporary differences between their financial and taxable profits. For years, they didn't account for deferred tax liabilities, thinking it wasn't a big deal. But one year, when the differences caught up with them, they had to pay a large amount of tax all at once. The sudden tax burden hurt their cash flow and caused their investors to panic. Had they followed INDAS-12, they would have gradually recognized the deferred tax liability over the years and prepared their stakeholders for the future tax payments. Robbie thought for a moment and asked, So, Professor, INDAS-12 is really about preparing for the future? It helps companies show their future tax liabilities and assets, so there are no surprises later on? The professor smiled, pleased with Robbie's insight. Exactly, Robbie. INDAS-12 helps companies and their investors understand the tax impact of temporary differences between financial reporting and tax laws. Whether it's a deferred tax liability, like in Meta Manufacturing's case, or a deferred tax asset, like in Sharma Pharmaceutical's case, the standard ensures that the company's financial statements reflect their future tax obligations and benefits accurately. This way, companies can manage their tax planning and stakeholders can make informed decisions without being caught off guard by future tax surprises. Robbie left the class that day with a much clearer understanding of INDAS-12. The professor's stories about real-life businesses had made the abstract concepts of deferred tax liabilities and assets come to life, showing how important it was for companies to reflect these in their financial statements to give a true and fair view of their future tax situation. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One afternoon, Robbie sat in his accounting class as the professor began explaining INDAS 16, property, plant, and equipment. The topic seemed complex to Ravi, especially when it came to understanding how companies should account for large assets like buildings, machinery, or vehicles. Sensing his confusion, the professor, known for his storytelling style, decided to share a case study to simplify things. Ravi, the professor began, let me tell you about a company called Patel Engineering, a large manufacturing business that recently built a new factory. Now, when Patel Engineering constructed this factory, they didn't just pay for the building alone. There were multiple costs involved like buying the land, constructing the building, installing machinery, and even training their employees to use that machinery. The question is, how does the company account for all of these expenses? Ravi nodded thinking about the variety of costs a company might incur when setting up a new factory. So, do they just treat everything as an expense, he asked. The professor smiled. Not exactly, Ravi. That's where INDAS-16 comes into play. This standard provides guidance on how to recognize and measure property, plant, and equipment. The key here is that these assets are not treated as immediate expenses. Instead, they are recognized as capital assets and recorded in the balance sheet. But it's not as simple as just recording the cost. INDAS-16 requires that all directly attributable costs of bringing the asset to its working condition be included in the cost of the asset. 
Ravi, still following, asked, What do you mean by directly attributable costs, Professor? Well, the professor continued, Let's take the example of Patel Engineering's new factory. The cost of the land and the cost of constructing the building are obvious. But in addition to that, any costs directly related to getting the factory ready for use, such as transportation of the machinery, installation costs, and even fees for architects and engineers, are all part of the cost of the asset. Even the costs for testing the machinery to ensure it's working properly before production starts are included. Robbie leaned forward, starting to understand the concept. So, everything that's necessary to get the asset up and running becomes part of the cost of the asset? Exactly, Ravi, the professor confirmed. But it doesn't end there. IND as 16 also requires companies to consider how they will depreciate these assets over time. You see, property, plant, and equipment don't last forever. They wear out or become obsolete. Depreciation is the process of spreading the cost of the asset over its useful life, so that each year, a portion of the asset's value is charged as an expense. This reflects the reduction in its value over time. The professor then shared another real-life case to illustrate depreciation. Let me tell you about another company, Shaw Textiles, which purchased a large machine for weaving fabrics. The company estimated that the machine would last for 10 years, and they expected to produce a certain number of textiles during that time. According to INDAS 16, Shaw Textiles needs to depreciate the cost of the machine over its useful life. In this case, they decided to use the straight-line method, where an equal amount of depreciation is charged every year. Ravi raised his hand, curious. What if the machine breaks down or needs repairs? Do they just expense that in the year it happens? Great question, Ravi. The professor said please with the engagement. Under INDAS 16, routine repairs and maintenance are indeed expensed in the year they happen. These are considered operational costs. However, if the company makes significant improvements that extend the life of the asset or increase its efficiency, like replacing key components of the machine, those costs are capitalized, meaning they are added to the assets carrying value and depreciated over time. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the complexity of the standard. So the company needs to make a distinction between regular repairs and big improvements? Exactly, the professor replied. This distinction ensures that companies don't inflate their profits by capitalizing expenses that should be charged in the current year. The professor then shifted the discussion to disposal of assets. Now, Ravi, what happens when a company decides to sell or dispose of an old asset, like an outdated machine? Ravi thought for a moment and responded, Do they remove the asset from their books? The professor smiled and said, That's right. When an asset is disposed of, whether it's sold or scrapped, the company removes the asset's carrying amount from its balance sheet. The carrying amount is the original cost of the asset minus the accumulated depreciation. If the company sells the asset for more than its carrying amount, they recognize a gain. If they sell it for less, they recognize a loss. This is another important part of IND AS16. To make things even clearer, the professor shared another real-life case study. Let me tell you about Gupta Constructions, a real estate company that decided to sell an old office building. The building had been on their balance sheet for years and had been depreciated. When they sold it, they made a profit because the selling price was higher than the carrying amount of the building. This gain was recognized in their profit and loss statement. On the other hand, if the building had been sold for less than its carrying value, Gupta Constructions would have reported a loss. Ravi, now fully immersed in the story, asked, Professor, how does this help investors and other stakeholders? The professor replied, Good question, Ravi. INDAS 16 ensures that companies accurately reflect the value of their assets and the wear and tear they experience over time. Depreciation helps match the cost of the asset to the revenues it generates, giving a true and fair view of the company's profitability. This transparency helps investors and other stakeholders make informed decisions about the company's financial health. The professor concluded with one final note. Remember Ravi, INDAS 16 isn't just about buying and selling assets. It's about how a company recognizes, measures, and depreciates property, plant, and equipment over time, ensuring that their financial statements reflect the real value of these assets.
Whether it's Patel Engineering's factory, Shaw Textiles machinery, or Gupta Construction's office building, this standard ensures that companies are providing accurate and reliable information to their stakeholders. Ravi left the class that day with a deep understanding of IND AS16, thanks to the professor's vivid stories. The standard no longer felt abstract. It was now tied to real-life businesses and their practical challenges. Share, subscribe, like, comment. Ravi sat in class, flipping through his notes, when the professor announced that they would be learning about IND AS17. Leases, though it had since been replaced by IND AS116. Ravi was puzzled. What exactly were leases and why did the standard change? Seeing the confusion on Ravi's face, the professor, known for his engaging stories, decided to explain this complex topic using a real-life example. Ravi, the professor began, let me tell you about a company called Kumar Electronics. They manufacture and sell home appliances, but instead of purchasing all of their retail stores, they lease many of them. So, every month, they pay rent for the stores they operate. Now earlier, under IND AS17, the way companies accounted for leases was quite different from how it is under IND AS116 today. Let's break it down. Ravi sat up straight, eager to learn. So, Professor, how did they account for leases under IND AS17? The professor smiled. Good question, Ravi. Under IND AS17, leases were classified into two categories operating leases, and finance leases. Let's take the example of Kumar Electronics. If they entered into a lease for one of their stores that didn't involve any ownership transfer, it was classified as an operating lease. This meant that every month, they simply expensed the rent payment in their profit and loss statement. There was no asset or liability recorded on their balance sheet. It was almost as if the lease never existed from a financial position point of view. Robbie furrowed his brow. So the company could lease multiple properties, but it wouldn't show up on their balance sheet? Exactly, the professor said. That's how operating leases worked under IND AS17. The lease payments were treated like regular operating expenses, and that was it. However, if Kumar Electronics entered into a lease where they effectively gained control over the asset for most of its useful life, like leasing a manufacturing plant for 20 years, it was classified as a finance lease. In this case, the company would recognize both an asset and a liability on their balance sheet. The asset represented the right to use the property, and the liability represented the obligation to make lease payments. Robbie nodded. So finance leases were treated more seriously, with the asset and liability on the balance sheet, but operating leases just looked like regular expenses? Exactly, the professor confirmed. Now, this distinction between operating and finance leases created a problem. Many companies were leasing assets under operating leases, and these leases weren't showing up on their balance sheets. This made it difficult for investors and other stakeholders to get a true picture of the company's financial position, especially for companies that relied heavily on leasing. That's one of the reasons why IND AS116 was introduced, to provide more transparency. Robbie leaned forward curious. So what changed with IND AS116, Professor? The professor's eyes lit up as he continued. Let me tell you about another company, Rao Logistics. They transport goods across the country, and most of their trucks are leased. Under IND AS116, there's no longer a distinction between operating and finance leases for lessees. Now Rao Logistics has to recognize a right-of-use asset and a corresponding lease liability for almost every lease they enter into. So, even if they're leasing trucks or warehouses for a few years, these leases show up on their balance sheet. Robbie was intrigued. So, Professor, now they can't just expense the lease payments like before? Exactly, the professor said. Under INDAS 116, Rao Logistics must record the leased trucks as assets, reflecting their right to use those trucks. On the liability side, they recognize the obligation to make future lease payments. This way, investors can see the full extent of the company's leasing activities. The only exception is for short-term leases, which are 12 months or less, and low-value assets, like laptops or small office equipment. For those, companies can still expense the payments, just like under INDAS 17. Robbie was starting to understand the significance. 
So INDAS 116, make sure that companies can't hide their leasing commitments off the balance sheet? Exactly, the professor said pleased with Robbie's insight. This provides more transparency to stakeholders. Imagine if Rao Logistics had been leasing hundreds of trucks under operating leases. Under INDAS 17, these leases wouldn't have appeared on their balance sheet, making the company look less indebted than they actually were. But under INDAS 116, all of these lease commitments are now visible on their balance sheet, showing the real financial position. The professor then shared another real-life case. Let me tell you about a company called Desai Restaurants. They lease most of their outlets across India. Earlier, under INDAS 17, they only showed the lease payments as an expense, and none of the leases appeared on their balance sheet. But after the transition to INDAS 116, Desai Restaurants had to recognize a significant amount of lease liabilities for all their outlets. This suddenly made their balance sheet look more leveraged, but it gave a more accurate picture of their financial health. Ravi raised his hand. So, Professor, does this mean companies are more cautious about entering into leases now? The professor nodded. Yes, Ravi. Companies are definitely more careful now. Since IND AS 116 requires them to show both the asset and the liability, they think twice before entering into large or long-term leases. It also affects financial ratios, like the debt-to-equity ratio, making the company look more indebted than before. But in reality, it's just providing a clearer picture of their financial commitments. Robbie thought for a moment and asked, how does this affect the profit and loss statement? Do they still expense the lease payments? The professor explained, good question. Under IND AS 116, the lease payments are no longer expensed directly. Instead, the company depreciates the right-of-use asset over its useful life, and they also recognize interest on the lease liability. This changes the way leases impact the profit and loss statement. Instead of seeing a simple lease expense, you'll see depreciation and interest, which can affect how the company's profitability looks in the short term. Ravi nodded, now understanding why INDAS 116 had replaced INDAS 17. It wasn't just about accounting for leases differently. It was about ensuring that companies were transparent in showing the true impact of their leasing activities on their financial position. The professor concluded, so, Ravi, INDAS 116 may seem more complicated, but it provides a more accurate view of a company's financial obligations. Whether it's leasing retail stores like Kumar Electronics, trucks like Rao Logistics, or restaurants like Desai Restaurants, the new standard ensures that all leases are accounted for in a way that reflects their true economic impact. It's all about making sure that stakeholders can see the full picture. Robbie left the class with a much clearer understanding of how leases were accounted for and why the shift from INDAS 17 to INDAS 116 had been necessary. The professor's real-life stories had once again made the subject come alive for him. Share, subscribe, like, comment. One day, during an accounting class, Ravi sat attentively as the professor began discussing IND AS19, employee benefits. The topic seemed overwhelming to Ravi because it dealt with various kinds of employee benefits that companies provide, ranging from short-term wages to long-term pensions. Noticing Ravi's hesitation, the professor, known for his unique way of explaining concepts through real-life examples, decided to break it down in a way that would be easy to grasp. Ravi, the professor began, imagine you're working for a company called Singh Enterprises, a large manufacturing firm. This company provides different kinds of benefits to its employees, like monthly salaries, bonuses, leave encashments, and even a pension plan for those who retire after years of service. Now, how do you think the company accounts for all these benefits? Ravi thought for a moment. Well, they must just record them as expenses, right? The professor smiled. That's partly correct, Ravi, but it's not as simple as just recording expenses. Under IND AS 19, employee benefits are classified into different categories, and each category is accounted for differently. Let's start with short-term benefits, which include things like salaries, bonuses, and leave encashment. These are easy to understand. Singh Enterprises pays these amounts within a year so they're recognized as an expense in the profit and loss statement when the employees earn them. For example, if you work at Singh Enterprises, 
Your monthly salary would be recorded as an expense when it's due to you. Robbie nodded following the idea. So, for short-term benefits, it's just like any other expense. What about the long-term ones? The professor, pleased with the question, continued. Now, this is where INDAS-19 becomes interesting. Let's talk about long-term employee benefits, such as a pension plan. At Singh Enterprises, employees who work for more than 25 years are eligible for a pension after they retire. The company promises to pay them a fixed amount every month for the rest of their lives. But here's the challenge. How does Singh Enterprises account for this future obligation today? Robbie looked puzzled. How do they know how much they'll have to pay in the future? And what if employees leave before retirement? The professor nodded. Exactly, Ravi. That's where actuarial assumptions come into play. Under IND AS19, Singh Enterprises needs to estimate how many employees will retire, how long they will live after retirement, and how much the company will have to pay each year. These estimates involve factors like life expectancy, employee turnover rates, and inflation. Based on these assumptions, the company calculates something called the present value of the defined benefit obligation. This represents the current cost of all future pension payments. Robbie leaned forward, now curious. So, they calculate how much the future payments are worth today? But what if their assumptions are wrong? Great question, Robbie. The professor responded. That's exactly why IND AS19 requires companies to regularly review their actuarial assumptions and adjust the pension liability if things change. For example, if employees are living longer than expected, Singh Enterprises might have to increase the pension liability because they'll be paying out pensions for a longer period. This change in the liability is called an actuarial gain or loss, and it's usually recognized in the company's other comprehensive income. Ravi was starting to get the hang of it. So, they keep adjusting the amount they owe based on new information? Exactly, said the professor. Now, let's take another real-life example. There's a company called Sharma Textiles. They offer their employees both gratuity and post-retirement medical benefits. Gratuity is a lump sum paid when an employee retires, while post-retirement medical benefits are ongoing payments for health care after retirement. Under IND AS19, Sharma Textiles must estimate the future payments for both benefits and recognize a liability in their balance sheet today. The professor paused, allowing Ravi to process the information. Now, the challenge for Sharma Textiles is that they need to estimate not just how long employees will live, but also the cost of medical care in the future, which can rise due to inflation. This means they need to account for both current and future costs in their financial statements. Ravi interjected. But how does this affect the company's profitability? If they're recording liabilities for future payments, doesn't that reduce their profits? The professor nodded. Exactly, Ravi. Recording these liabilities does affect the company's financial position. It increases their obligations, which reduces profitability in the short term. However, this is necessary for transparency. Investors and other stakeholders need to know the full extent of the company's obligations including future payments to employees. That's why INDAS-19 is so important. It ensures that companies can't hide these future commitments off their balance sheets. The professor then shared another real-life case study to illustrate the impact of INDAS-19. Let me tell you about a company called Meta Pharmaceuticals. They offer both short-term incentives like performance bonuses and long-term incentives like stock options. Under INDAS-19, the short-term incentives are recognized as expenses when employees earn them, just like the salary we discussed earlier. But the stock options are different. The company needs to estimate the fair value of the stock options at the time they are granted, and this expense is spread over the vesting period, the time it takes for employees to become eligible to exercise the options. Ravi, intrigued by the complexity, asked so they don't wait until the employees actually exercise the options to record the expense. The professor smiled again. Exactly, Ravi. The expense is recognized over the vesting period, even if the employees don't exercise the options immediately. This ensures that the company's financial statements reflect the true cost of the employee benefits, even if the actual payment happens in the future. The professor wrapped up the lesson with a final point. Remember, Ravi, INDAS-19 is not just about paying salaries or bonuses. 
It's about recognizing all types of employee benefits, whether they're short-term, long-term, or even post-retirement. The goal is to ensure that companies provide a true and fair view of their financial position, showing all current and future obligations to their employees. Whether it's pension plans at Singh Enterprises, gratuity at Sharma Textiles, or stock options at Meta Pharmaceuticals, IND AS19 ensures that all employee benefits are properly accounted for. Robbie left the class that day with a clearer understanding of how employee benefits were handled in financial statements. The professor's stories about real companies had made the subject come alive, turning an abstract standard into a practical, relatable topic. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Robbie was eager to learn about IND AS20, Accounting for Government Grants and Disclosure of Government Assistance. The concept seemed complicated, and Robbie felt a bit lost. Sensing this, the professor, known for his captivating storytelling, decided to explain the topic through a relatable case study. Ravi, the professor started, let me tell you about a company called Aurora Manufacturing, which produces eco-friendly products. Last year, they applied for a government grant aimed at promoting sustainable businesses. They were thrilled when they received a grant of 5 million rupees to invest in new machinery that would help them produce their products more efficiently. Now, the question is, how does Aurora Manufacturing account for this grant under IND AS20? Ravi leaned in curious. So, do they just record it as income? The professor chuckled. Not quite, Ravi. IND AS20 has specific guidelines on how to handle government grants. The first step is to determine whether the grant is related to income or assets. In the case of Aurora Manufacturing, since they received the grant for purchasing machinery, it is classified as a capital grant, which is tied to an asset. Got it, Ravi responded. So, what happens next? Under IND AS20, Aurora Manufacturing has two main options for recognizing this grant, the professor explained. They can either recognize the grant as deferred income and then systematically reduce this income over the useful life of the asset, or they can deduct the grant amount from the carrying amount of the asset itself. Let's consider both methods. Ravi listened intently as the professor continued. If Aurora Manufacturing chooses the first method, they would record the 5 million rupee grant as deferred income on their balance sheet. Then, as the machinery is used, they would recognize portions of this grant as income, which offsets the depreciation expense of the machinery each year. For example, if the machinery has a useful life of 10 years, they would recognize 500,000 rupees as income each year. Robbie nodded, trying to visualize the process. And what about the second method? The second method is simpler, the professor explained. In this case, Aurora Manufacturing would reduce the carrying amount of the machinery by the grant amount. So, if the machinery costs 10 million rupees, they would show it as only 5 million rupees on their balance sheet. This means that the depreciation expense would also be lower, as they would be depreciating a smaller amount. Robbie smiled, now understanding the options. So, the company has a choice based on how they want to reflect the grant in their financial statements. Exactly, the professor confirmed. The standard also emphasizes the importance of disclosure. Aurora Manufacturing must disclose the nature of the grant, any unfulfilled conditions attached to it, and the accounting policy adopted for recognition in their financial statements. This transparency is crucial for stakeholders who need to understand how the grant affects the company's financial position. Does this apply to other forms of government assistance as well? Ravi asked. Great question, Ravi. Yes, it does. Let me tell you about another real-life example involving a company called Bunsel Textiles. They received a government subsidy to promote exports. This subsidy, while not a grant for a specific asset, must also be disclosed under IND AS20. Bunsel Textiles needs to explain the subsidy in their financial statements, including any conditions that must be met to retain the subsidy. The professor paused to let the information sink in. The key takeaway is that whether it's a grant for machinery like Aurora Manufacturing or a subsidy for exports like Bunsell Textiles, INDAS 20 ensures that companies are transparent about the benefits they receive from the government and how these benefits impact their financial statements. Ravi pondered the implications. So, 
The goal is to provide a true and fair view of the company's finances while also being accountable for government assistance? Precisely, the professor replied, impressed with Robbie's insight. The regulations ensure that financial statements reflect not just the economic reality of the company, but also the support it receives from the government. This transparency helps investors and other stakeholders make informed decisions. The professor's stories about Aurora Manufacturing and Bunsel Textiles had made the concept of government grants and disclosures accessible, transforming a complex accounting standard into a clear and engaging narrative. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Ravi was keen to grasp the intricacies of INDAS 21, the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. The professor, known for his engaging storytelling, recognized Ravi's eagerness and decided to illustrate the concept through relatable case studies. This company operates in India but sources its products from places like the United States and Japan. Now, let's say Global Traders purchases components worth 100,000 US dollars. When they make this purchase, they need to consider the exchange rate between the Indian rupee and the US dollar. Exactly, the professor confirmed. However, the challenge arises because exchange rates fluctuate. Suppose the payment is not made immediately and after a month, the exchange rate changes to 78 rupees to $1. When global traders finally pays for the components, they would then need to pay 78 lakh rupees instead of 75 lakh. This situation creates a foreign exchange loss of 3 lakh rupees. Ravi raised his eyebrows. So, they would have to account for that loss in their financial statements? Correct, Ravi. Under INDAS 21, the company must recognize exchange differences arising from the settlement of monetary items, like payables and receivables, in profit or loss. Now, let's look at another scenario to understand the implications further. The professor continued, Imagine that Global Traders also has a foreign currency account in Japan where they maintain a balance of 1 million Japanese yen. At the beginning of the year, the exchange rate is 5 rupees to 1 yen, meaning the account value is 5 lakh rupees. As the year progresses, the value of the yen appreciates, and the exchange rate shifts to 4 rupees per yen by year end. Ravi listened intently, intrigued by the concept. So, if they checked the balance at the end of the year, they would now record it as 4 lakh rupees? Not quite, the professor clarified. Since the yen has appreciated against the rupee, the account's value in Indian rupees has increased. They would need to revalue the account at the new exchange rate. So, 1 million yen would now be valued at 10 lakh rupees. This means global traders recognizes a foreign exchange gain of 5 lakh rupees which would be reflected in their profit for the year. But how does the company report these fluctuations in their financial statements? The professor explained, INDAS 21 requires that all monetary items, such as cash, receivables, and payables, be translated into the reporting currency at the closing rate at each reporting date. The foreign exchange differences must be recognized in the profit or loss. For non-monetary items, such as fixed assets, the initial transaction is recorded at the exchange rate on the date of the transaction. However, if there is a change in the functional currency, this would also require careful consideration under INDAS 21. Ravi, now more confident, asked, What if a company has foreign operations, say, a subsidiary in Europe? Excellent question, the professor responded enthusiastically. The assets and liabilities of the subsidiary are translated at the closing exchange rate, while income and expenses are translated at the exchange rates on the dates of the transactions. To illustrate this further, the professor shared a story about a company called Kumar Industries. Kumar Industries operates in India and has a subsidiary in Germany. When they consolidate their financial statements, they translate the subsidiary's assets and liabilities into Indian rupees. If the euro appreciates against the rupee, Kumar Industries may report a foreign currency translation gain. Conversely, if the euro depreciates, they would report a loss. This shows the volatility and impact of foreign exchange rates on the consolidated financial statements. Ravi pondered the implications of these translations. So, companies need to be aware of exchange rate movements not only for their day-to-day -day transactions, but also for how they present their overall financial position.
Absolutely right, Ravi, the professor affirmed. INDAS 21 ensures that businesses are equipped to handle the complexities of foreign currency transactions and translations, providing a clear picture of their financial health in a globalized environment. As the class concluded, Ravi felt more enlightened about INDAS 21. The professor's engaging narratives about global traders and Kumar industries had transformed a potentially dry topic into a compelling story about the real effects of foreign exchange rates on financial reporting. With a newfound appreciation for the standard, Ravi left class ready to tackle the intricacies of international accounting. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Ravi was curious about IND AS 23, borrowing costs. He understood that borrowing money often comes with interest, but he wasn't sure how these costs were accounted for in financial statements. The professor, known for his engaging storytelling, decided to clarify this important concept through real-life case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor started, you're working for a company called Tech Innovations, which is planning to expand its operations by building a new manufacturing facility. To finance this project, Tech Innovations decides to take out a loan of 50 million rupees at an interest rate of 8%. Now, the company will incur borrowing costs during the construction period. The question is, how should these borrowing costs be treated under INDAS 23? Do they just record the interest as an expense in the profit and loss statement? The professor smiled, pleased with Robbie's question. That's a common misconception. Under INDAS 23, borrowing costs that are directly attributable to the acquisition, construction, or production of a qualifying asset must be capitalized as part of the asset's cost. In this case, since the new manufacturing facility is a qualifying asset, Tech Innovations should capitalize the interest costs incurred during the construction period. Robbie raises eyebrows, intrigued. So, if they're building the facility for, let's say, two years, they would add the interest cost to the asset's value instead of just expensing them? Exactly, the professor affirmed. During the construction period, all interest costs that are incurred can be added to the cost of the asset. So, if Tech Innovations pays 4 million rupees in interest over the two years, this amount would be added to the total cost of the new manufacturing facility. As a result, instead of recognizing the interest expense immediately in the profit and loss statement, it is included in the balance sheet as part of the asset's value. Interesting, Ravi said, beginning to connect the dots. But what if the project takes longer than expected? Do they keep capitalizing the interest? That's right, Ravi. However, once the asset is completed and ready for use, any additional interest costs would be recognized as an expense in the profit and loss statement. The key is that the costs must be directly attributable to the construction of the asset. To illustrate further, the professor shared a story about a company called Green Solutions. Green Solutions was building a state-of-the-art waste management facility, which also required significant financing. They took a loan of 30 million rupees at an interest rate of 7%. Throughout the construction period of three years, they capitalized all interest payments, amounting to 6 million rupees. Once the facility was completed, this total was added to the cost of the facility on their balance sheet. Robbie's curiosity deepened. And when they start using the facility, what happens to the capitalized interest? When the facility becomes operational, Green Solutions would begin to depreciate the total cost, which now includes the capitalized borrowing costs, the professor explained. Ravi then asked, what if Green Solutions had to halt construction due to unforeseen circumstances? such as regulatory approvals being delayed? Great question, the professor replied. In such cases, INDAS 23 stipulates that if the asset is not being constructed, borrowing costs incurred during this period should not be capitalized. Instead, they would be recognized as an expense in the profit and loss statement. Companies need to assess when to halt the capitalization of borrowing costs carefully. Consider Mohan Constructions, which undertook a large infrastructure project funded by a loan. During this period, they had to expense the interest costs because the project was no longer a qualifying asset for capitalization. This highlights the importance of assessing the eligibility of borrowing costs in relation to the asset's construction timeline. Ravi absorbed the information, realizing the importance of INDAS 23. So, 
It's crucial for companies to track borrowing costs accurately, especially in long-term projects. Absolutely, Ravi, the professor affirmed. Understanding how to manage and account for borrowing costs can significantly impact a company's financial statements. Properly capitalizing these costs provides a more accurate picture of an asset's true cost and helps in presenting a clearer financial position. As the class concluded, Ravi felt empowered with a deeper understanding of INDAS 23. With this knowledge in hand, Ravi was ready to tackle the nuances of borrowing costs in financial reporting. As the accounting class got underway, Ravi was eager to learn about INDAS 24, Related Party Disclosures. He understood that relationships could complicate financial reporting, but he was unsure how this standard worked in practice. The professor, known for his storytelling prowess, decided to clarify this concept through a series of engaging case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began, that you are working for a company called Innovative Solutions, which specializes in software development. Recently, Innovative Solutions entered into a contract with a company called Tech Supplies, owned by Ravi's uncle. This relationship could have implications for how the financial statements are prepared. The question is, how does INDAS 24 govern related party disclosures in this scenario? Robbie leaned forward, intrigued. Exactly, the professor affirmed. Under INDAS 24, a related party is defined as a person or entity that is related to the reporting entity. This includes key management personnel, family members of key management personnel, and entities controlled or significantly influenced by such individuals. In this case, because your uncle owns tech supplies, Innovative Solutions must disclose this relationship in their financial statements. Ravi nodded, beginning to see the implications. But what else do they need to disclose? The professor continued, The standard requires disclosure of transactions with related parties as well. For example, if Innovative Solutions purchases software licenses from tech supplies for 10 lakh rupees, they must not only disclose the relationship but also provide details of the transaction. This includes the nature of the transaction, the amounts involved, and any outstanding balances at the reporting date. The aim is to ensure transparency and inform users of the financial statements about the potential impact of these related party transactions on the entity's financial position. Does this mean they have to disclose the terms of the transactions as well? Robbie asked, seeking clarity. Absolutely, the professor replied. Innovative solutions must disclose whether the transactions were conducted on terms equivalent to those prevailing in an arm's-length transaction, meaning that the terms should be similar to those that would be agreed upon by unrelated parties. If the terms were favorable or unfavorable compared to market conditions, this must also be disclosed. To further illustrate, the professor shared a story about another company, Green Electronics. Green Electronics had a director who was also a major shareholder in a supplier company called Bright Parts. Last year, Green Electronics entered into a significant purchase agreement for components worth 20 lakh rupees. Due to the director's interest in Bright Parts, Green Electronics disclosed the nature of the relationship, the amount of the transaction, and noted that the prices were comparable to market rates. Ravi listened attentively, understanding the need for transparency. How does the company determine who qualifies as a related party? Good question, Ravi. Under INDAS 24, companies are required to assess relationships at the control level. They must consider not only direct relationships, but also indirect ones. For instance, if a family member of a key management personnel works for a business that provides services to the company, that relationship should also be disclosed. It's about identifying all parties that can influence or be influenced by the company's decisions, the professor elaborated. Ravi then asked, what if the company fails to disclose related party transactions? What are the consequences? The professor sighed. That's a critical issue, Ravi. It can also attract regulatory scrutiny. In serious cases, it may result in legal consequences for the company and its directors, as noncompliance with INDAS 24 could be seen as a violation of fiduciary duties. The professor shared a cautionary tale about Mohan Limited. Mohan Limited neglected to disclose several transactions with its subsidiary, which was owned by a close relative of the CEO. When this was discovered, it raised alarms among investors and regulators. 
The company faced significant reputational damage and had to restate its financial statements, leading to a loss of investor trust. As the class progressed, Robbie felt a sense of urgency regarding the importance of compliance with INDAS 24. So, it's about building trust and maintaining integrity in financial reporting, right? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. Related party disclosures enhance the reliability of financial statements by providing a clear picture of potential conflicts of interest. Transparency ensures that stakeholders are well-informed and can make decisions based on complete information. As the lesson concluded, Ravi felt enlightened about INDAS 24. The professor's engaging stories about innovative solutions and green electronics had made the complex topic of related party disclosures accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was prepared to approach related party transactions with the seriousness and diligence they warranted, ensuring transparency in his future financial reporting endeavors. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Ravi was excited to delve into INDAS 27, separate financial statements. He had a basic understanding of financial reporting, but was unsure about the significance of separate financial statements. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began, you are working for a company called Digitech, which is a parent company that owns several subsidiaries involved in various aspects of technology development. Now, Digitech needs to prepare its separate financial statements, which means it will report its financial position, performance, and cash flows independently of its subsidiaries. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. So, the separate financial statements are specifically for Digitech, separate from its subsidiaries? Exactly, the professor affirmed. Under INDAS 27, a parent company can prepare separate financial statements in which it accounts for its investments in subsidiaries, associates, and joint ventures using the cost method or the equity method. This means Digitech will present its assets, liabilities, and equity without consolidating the results of its subsidiaries. Ravi contemplated this for a moment. Correct, Ravi, the professor explained. If Smart Solutions is performing well, that performance may increase the value of Digitech's investment over time, but this will not be reflected until Digitech decides to sell or revalue that investment. To deepen Ravi's understanding, the professor shared a story about Tech Giants Limited. Tech Giants, a parent company, had several subsidiaries engaged in different technologies, including a software development firm and a hardware manufacturing company. In its separate financial statements, Tech Giants reported the investments in its subsidiaries using the cost method. If the software development firm had initially been acquired for 10 crore rupees, that amount would be recorded as the investment in the separate financial statements. Any dividends received from the subsidiary would be recognized as income in the profit and loss statement of Tech Giants. Ravi was beginning to grasp the nuances. And if Tech Giants decides to increase its stake in the software firm, would it account for that differently? Great observation, Ravi, the professor replied. If Tech Giants acquired additional shares in the software firm, increasing its stake from 50% to 75%, it would recognize this increase using the equity method in its separate financial statements. This means that the carrying amount of the investment would be adjusted to reflect the share of profits or losses of the subsidiary. However, in the initial acquisition, it would still report the investment at cost in its separate financial statements. Robbie then asked, what happens if a subsidiary incurs losses? How does that affect the parent's separate financial statements? Another insightful question, the professor acknowledged. In separate financial statements, the parent does not consolidate the losses of the subsidiary. Instead, the investment in the subsidiary is recorded at cost or adjusted using the equity method if applicable. So, if the subsidiary incurs losses, it does not directly reduce the parent's profit. However, if the losses are significant, the parent may need to assess the recoverable amount of the investment and may have to recognize an impairment if necessary. The professor provided a real-world example to illustrate the point. Consider ABC Holdings, which invested in a loss-making subsidiary called XYZ Innovations. Despite the losses, ABC Holdings maintained its investment in the separate financial statements at cost. However, after two years of continuous losses, ABC Holdings assessed the situation and found that the fair value of its investment had diminished. As a result, 
It recognized an impairment loss to reflect the reduced value of its investment in the separate financial statements. Ravi reflected on the implications of these principles. So, separate financial statements provide a clear view of the parent company's financial position and performance without being influenced by its subsidiaries? Exactly, Ravi, the professor affirmed. INDAS 27 ensures that stakeholders can see the direct impact of investments in subsidiaries without dilution from the subsidiary's operational performance. As the class wrapped up, Ravi felt a sense of accomplishment regarding his understanding of INDAS 27. The professor's engaging narratives about Digitech and tech giants had transformed a complex topic into a relatable and relevant subject. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach separate financial statements with confidence, appreciating their role in providing clarity and transparency in financial reporting. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Ravi was eager to learn about INDAS 28, Investments and Associates and Joint Ventures. The professor, renowned for his storytelling, decided to explain this concept through engaging real-life case studies. This partnership was structured as a joint venture where both companies would share control over the project. The question is, how does INDAS 28 guide Global Tech in reporting its investment in this joint venture? So, Global Tech would account for its investment in eco solutions differently than it would for a regular investment, right? Exactly, the professor confirmed. Under INDAS 28, a joint venture is defined as a contractual arrangement whereby two or more parties undertake an economic activity that is subject to joint control. This means that global tech must account for its investment in eco-solutions using the equity method. This method requires the investor to recognize its share of the joint venture's profits or losses in its own financial statements. Robbie furrowed his brow, trying to understand. So, if Eco Solutions earns profits, Global Tech would recognize a portion of those profits in its own financial statements. Correct, Ravi, the professor replied. For example, if Eco Solutions made a profit of 2 crore rupees and Global Tech owns 50% of the joint venture, it would recognize 1 crore rupees as its share of profit. This recognition happens in the profit and loss statement of Global Tech, increasing its earnings for the period. To provide more clarity, the professor shared a story about Technopartners. Technopartners, a software development company, entered into a joint venture with Green Innovations to create eco-friendly software solutions. Technopartners invested 10 crore rupees in the joint venture. If Green Innovations earned a profit of 4 crore rupees in a year, Technopartners would recognize its share of 2 crore rupees in its own profit and loss statement, reflecting the performance of the joint venture. Ravi was beginning to grasp the concept. And what about associates? How does global tech account for an investment in an associate company? Great question, Ravi, the professor said. An associate is defined as an entity over which the investor has significant influence, but not control. Significant influence usually means owning 20 to 50% of the voting power. If global tech invested in tech supplies, owning 30%, it would also use the equity method to account for this investment. The professor continued, for instance, if tech supplies reported a profit of 5 crore rupees, global tech would recognize its share of 1.5 crore rupees as its share of profit in its financial statements. However, it is important to note that the equity method is applied similarly for both associates and joint ventures, but the nature of control differs. Ravi pondered for a moment, what if Eco Solutions or Tech Supplies incurred losses? How would that affect Global Tech's financial statements? The professor nodded, pleased with Ravi's curiosity. If either the joint venture or the associate incurs losses, Global Tech would recognize its share of those losses as well. For example, if Eco Solutions incurred a loss of 1 crore rupees, Global Tech would record a loss of 50 lakh rupees in its profit and loss statement. However, it is important to note that global tech can only recognize losses up to the extent of its investment in the associate or joint venture. If the losses exceed the carrying amount of the investment, global tech would not recognize further losses. To emphasize the importance of these principles, the professor shared a real-world example. Consider smart technologies, which invested in a joint venture with future innovations. 
The joint venture started off strong, but after two years, it faced unexpected challenges and incurred significant losses. Smart Technologies had to evaluate the carrying amount of its investment. Since the losses exceeded its initial investment, it recognized an impairment loss, reflecting the diminished value of its investment in the joint venture. Ravi felt a sense of clarity emerging. So, it's crucial for companies to assess their investments in associates and joint ventures carefully, especially when it comes to recognizing profits and losses? Absolutely, Ravi, the professor confirmed. The equity method allows investors to reflect their share of profits or losses from associates and joint ventures, providing a more accurate picture of their financial performance. This transparency is essential for stakeholders to understand the impact of these investments on the parent company's financial health. As the class wrapped up, Ravi felt empowered by his understanding of INDAS 28. The professor's engaging stories about global tech innovations and techno partners had transformed a complex accounting standard into a clear and relatable topic. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach investments in associates and joint ventures with confidence, appreciating their role in financial reporting. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Ravi was eager to explore the intricacies of INDAS 29, financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies. He had heard the term hyperinflation before, but had limited knowledge about how it affected financial reporting. The professor, well known for his engaging storytelling, decided to illuminate this concept through real-life case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began, you are working for a company called Global Trade Incorporated based in a country experiencing hyperinflation. In this scenario, prices of goods and services rise dramatically, often exceeding 50% over a short period. This situation poses significant challenges for financial reporting. The question is, how does INDAS 29 guide companies in such economic environments? Robbie leaned forward intrigued. So, what does hyperinflation mean for a company's financial statements? Excellent question, Ravi, the professor responded. Under INDAS 29, when a company operates in a hyperinflationary economy, it must adjust its financial statements to reflect the impact of inflation. The professor then shared a story about a fictional company called Tech Solutions Limited. Tech Solutions is based in a hyperinflationary economy where the inflation rate skyrocketed to 70% over a year. As a result, the company faced challenges in accurately representing its financial position and performance. To comply with INDAS 29, Tech Solutions had to adjust its historical costs of assets, liabilities, income, and expenses to reflect their current values. Ravi listened intently, beginning to grasp the concept. So, if Tech Solutions purchased machinery for 5 crore rupees two years ago, how would it adjust that figure? Right on point, the professor exclaimed. If the inflation rate during that period was high, Tech Solutions would restate the cost of the machinery using a price index. For example, if the price index had increased by 30% since the purchase, the restated value of the machinery in the current financial statements would be approximately 6.5 crore rupees. To deepen Ravi's understanding, the professor provided another example. Consider Green Energy Corporation, which operates in a hyperinflationary economy. Last year, it reported revenue of 15 crore rupees. Due to hyperinflation, this revenue does not hold the same value as when it was earned. Therefore, Green Energy Corporation would need to restate its revenue to reflect the current purchasing power. If the inflation rate is recorded at 50% for the year, the adjusted revenue would be approximately 22 and a half crore rupees in the current financial statements. And what about expenses? How does hyperinflation affect them? Great observation, Ravi, the professor continued. Just like revenues, expenses also need to be adjusted for inflation. If Green Energy Corporation incurred costs of 10 crore rupees last year, this figure would need to be adjusted using the price index. If the price index increased by 40%, the restated expense would be 14 crore rupees. But how does this impact profit? Ravi asked, curiosity peaked. The impact on profit is significant, the professor explained. In hyperinflationary economies, the real value of profits may be misleading if not adjusted. 
When Tech Solutions or Green Energy Corporation presents their profit figures without adjusting for inflation, it could lead to an overstatement of profitability, which may mislead investors and stakeholders. Ravi, ponder the implications. So, financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies is not just about numbers. It's about ensuring that the financial statements provide a true and fair view. Exactly, Ravi, the professor affirmed. INDAS 29 emphasizes that financial statements should reflect the current economic realities of hyperinflationary environments. To illustrate the consequences of failing to comply with INDAS 29, the professor recounted a cautionary tale about a company called Rapid Growth Limited. Rapid Growth operated in a hyperinflationary economy, but failed to adjust its financial statements. When investors realized that the reported profits were inflated due to the lack of adjustments for inflation, the company faced severe reputational damage. Its stock price plummeted and regulatory authorities intervened, leading to significant fines. So, in hyperinflationary economies, accurate financial reporting is crucial for maintaining trust with investors and stakeholders? Absolutely, the professor confirmed. As the class concluded, Robbie felt enlightened about INDAS 29. The professor's captivating stories about tech solutions and green energy corporation had made the complex topic of financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was prepared to approach financial reporting in such challenging environments with confidence and clarity, understanding the critical role of accurate reporting in preserving stakeholder trust. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Ravi felt a mix of anticipation and curiosity about IND AS32, Financial Instruments, presentation. He had often heard about financial instruments but was unsure how they were presented in financial statements. The professor, known for his captivating storytelling, decided to clarify this important concept through relatable real-life case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor started. You are working for a company called Global Innovations Limited that has various financial instruments in its portfolio, including equity shares, bonds, and derivatives. The question is, how does INDAS 32 guide the presentation of these financial instruments in the financial statements? Ravi leaned forward, eager to learn. So, how does the standard define a financial instrument? Excellent question, Ravi, the professor replied. Under INDAS 32, a financial instrument is any contract that gives rise to a financial asset for one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument for another entity. This means that companies must carefully classify their financial instruments to present them correctly in their financial statements. To illustrate this, the professor shared a story about TechWave Incorporated. TechWave has a diverse portfolio, including investments in equity shares of another company. Green Energy Corporation, and some bonds issued by Future Finance Limited. Each of these instruments needs to be classified based on their nature and the rights and obligations they create. Robbie nodded, beginning to understand. So, how does TechWave classify its financial instruments? Great observation, Robbie, the professor continued. According to INDAS 32, financial instruments can be classified as either financial assets, financial liabilities, or equity instruments. In TechWave's case, the equity shares of Green Energy Corporation are classified as financial assets, while the bonds from Future Finance Limited are classified as financial liabilities. This classification is crucial for understanding the financial position and performance of the company. Ravi was intrigued. What about the presentation of these instruments in the financial statements? Another excellent question, the professor responded. Under INDAS 32, financial instruments must be presented in a manner that clearly distinguishes between liabilities and equity. For example, if TechWave issued convertible bonds, bonds that can be converted into equity shares, this financial instrument would need to be split between a financial liability and an equity component. The liability portion reflects the obligation to pay interest and repay the principal, while the equity portion represents the potential conversion into shares. To provide a practical example, the professor introduced a scenario involving ABC Holdings. ABC Holdings issued convertible bonds worth 10 crore rupees, with an interest rate of 8%. According to IND AS32, 
ABC Holdings must present these convertible bonds by splitting them into two components, the financial liability for the interest payments and the equity component for the conversion option. This ensures that the financial statements provide a clear picture of both the obligations and the potential ownership dilution. Ravi pondered the implications of this classification. So, if ABC Holdings presents these convertible bonds as a single line item, it might mislead stakeholders about its true financial obligations and potential equity structure. Exactly, the professor affirmed. To emphasize the importance of this standard, the professor shared a cautionary tale about a company called Rapid Finance Limited. Rapid Finance failed to properly classify and present its financial instruments, mixing equity and liability components in a single line item. When investors discovered this lack of clarity, they lost trust in the company's financial reporting. The stock price plummeted and regulatory authorities intervened, leading to significant fines and reputational damage. Ravi felt a sense of urgency about the importance of compliance with IND AS32. So, the way financial instruments are presented can significantly impact a company's reputation and investor trust? Absolutely, the professor confirmed. The clarity provided by INDAS 32 ensures that stakeholders can make informed decisions based on a company's financial position and the nature of its financial instruments. As the class concluded, Ravi felt enlightened about INDAS 32. The professor's engaging narratives about Global Innovations Limited and TechWave Incorporated had made the complex topic of financial instruments and their presentation accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was prepared to approach financial reporting with confidence, appreciating the critical role that clear and accurate presentation plays in fostering transparency and trust in the financial markets. Share, subscribe, like, comment. He had often heard this term tossed around in discussions about financial performance, but he wanted to understand its significance and calculation. The professor, renowned for his storytelling ability, decided to explain this concept through engaging real-life case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began, you are working for a company called NextGen Technologies Limited, which has recently gone public. One of the most critical metrics for investors and analysts is the company's earnings per share, or EPS. The question is, how does INDAS 33 guide the calculation and presentation of EPS? What exactly is earnings per share, and why is it important? Great question, the professor replied. It is a key indicator of a company's profitability and is often used by investors to gauge financial health and compare performance across companies. Under INDAS 33, companies must present both basic and diluted EPS in their financial statements. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Innovative Solutions Private. Lotte. Let's say Innovative Solutions reported a net profit of 10 crore rupees for the financial year. If the company has 1 crore outstanding shares, the basic EPS would be calculated as follows. The net profit of 10 crore rupees divided by 1 crore shares, resulting in an EPS of 10 rupees. Ravi nodded, beginning to understand. So, basic EPS is straightforward. Just net profit divided by the number of shares? Exactly, the professor confirmed. IND AS 33 also requires companies to calculate diluted EPS which accounts for potential dilution from convertible securities, stock options, and other financial instruments that could be converted into shares. This provides a more conservative view of earnings available to each share if all dilutive instruments are exercised. The professor continued with the story of Tech Innovations Limited. Let's say Tech Innovations has the same net profit of 10 crore rupees, but it also has convertible bonds that could convert into an additional 20 lakh shares. To calculate the diluted EPS, you would add these potential shares to the denominator. Thus, the diluted EPS calculation would be 10 crore rupees divided by 1 crore 20 lakh shares, resulting in an EPS of approximately 8.3 rupees. Ravi was intrigued. So, diluted EPS gives investors a sense of the lowest potential earnings per share if all options and convertible securities are exercised? Exactly, the professor responded. This distinction is crucial for investors as it reflects the worst-case scenario for their earnings if dilution occurs. This information allows them to make more informed investment decisions. To further clarify, the professor shared a real-world example involving Global Health Corporation. 
Global Health reported a net profit of 20 crore rupees for the year, with 2 crore outstanding shares. Its basic EPS would be 10 rupees. In this case, the diluted EPS would be calculated as 20 crore rupees divided by 2 crore 50 lakh shares, resulting in an EPS of approximately 7.8 rupees. The professor smiled at Ravi's curiosity. Reporting both provides a comprehensive picture of a company's earnings performance. Investors rely on this information to assess risk and make comparisons with other companies. A significant difference between basic and diluted EPS could indicate potential dilution risk, which might affect an investor's decision to buy or sell shares. Once investors realized the discrepancy, the company faced a severe backlash, resulting in a sharp decline in stock prices and loss of investor trust. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, a transparent and accurate calculation of EPS is vital for maintaining investor confidence? Absolutely, the professor confirmed. INDAS 33 ensures that companies provide clear information about their earnings, which is critical for maintaining transparency and trust in the financial markets. Accurate EPS reporting allows investors to make informed decisions and helps in evaluating the company's true performance. As the class concluded, Robbie felt empowered by his understanding of INDAS 33. The professor's engaging stories about next-gen technologies and innovative solutions have made the complex topic of earnings per share clear and relatable. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach financial reporting with confidence, appreciating the critical role that accurate EPS calculation plays in the world of finance and investment. As the accounting class began, Ravi was eager to learn about INDAS 34, Interim Financial Reporting. He had heard about interim reports but was unsure about their significance and how they differed from annual financial statements. The professor, known for his captivating storytelling, decided to illustrate this concept using engaging real-life case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor started, you are working for a company called Bright Future Industries, which operates in the fast-paced technology sector. As a publicly traded company, Bright Future is required to provide interim financial reports to its stakeholders. The question is, how does INDAS 34 guide these interim financial statements? Ravi leaned forward curious. What exactly are interim financial reports and why are they important? Great question, the professor replied. Interim financial reports are financial statements prepared for periods shorter than a full financial year, typically covering a quarter or half of the year. They provide timely financial information to investors and stakeholders allowing them to assess the company's performance and financial position between annual reports. INDAS 34 outlines the requirements for preparing and presenting these interim reports. To illustrate the importance of interim financial reporting, the professor shared a story about Tech Innovations Private. Limited, let's say Tech Innovations released its quarterly report for the first quarter of the financial year. In this report, the company would present its income statement statement of financial position, and cash flow statement for that quarter. This allows investors to gauge how the company is performing in real time, rather than waiting for the annual report. Robbie nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, interim reports help stakeholders understand the company's current performance? Exactly, the professor confirmed. For example, if Tech Innovations experienced a significant increase in sales during the first quarter, the interim report would highlight this growth. The professor continued with the story of Future Tech Limited. Future Tech operates in a rapidly changing market where technological advancements can significantly impact financial performance. For this reason, the company prepares interim financial reports to communicate its financial health to stakeholders promptly. If Future Tech announces a breakthrough product in the second quarter, the interim report would reflect any revenue generated from pre orders, demonstrating the potential growth and market response. Ravi was fascinated. How does INDAS 30 for ensure the reliability of these interim reports? INDAS 34 requires that interim financial reports include selected explanatory notes, which provide additional context to the figures presented. This ensures that stakeholders have sufficient information to understand the financial statements. For instance, if tech innovations faced an unexpected rise in operating expenses due to supply chain disruptions, the interim report would explain this situation, 
helping investors understand the impact on profitability. To further illustrate the relevance of interim financial reporting, the professor shared a real-world scenario involving Global Health Corporation. Global Health prepared its quarterly report for the third quarter, showing a decline in earnings due to regulatory changes impacting its operations. By reporting this interim information, the company kept investors informed about potential risks, allowing them to adjust their expectations accordingly. Robbie thought for a moment. So, timely interim reporting can help maintain transparency and trust with investors? Exactly, the professor affirmed. This consistency allows investors to better analyze performance trends over time. To emphasize the importance of accurate interim reporting, the professor shared a cautionary tale about rapid growth industries. Rapid growth failed to provide timely interim reports during a critical period of expansion. As a result, investors were left in the dark about the company's performance. Once the annual report was released, the significant fluctuations in performance led to a loss of investor trust and a decline in stock prices. Ravi felt the urgency of the lesson. Absolutely, the professor confirmed. IND AS34 ensures that stakeholders receive relevant information about a company's performance in a timely manner, allowing for informed decision-making and fostering a transparent financial environment. As the class concluded, Ravi felt enlightened about IND AS34. The professor's engaging stories about bright future industries and tech innovations had made the complex topic of interim financial reporting accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was prepared to approach financial reporting with confidence, understanding the critical role that timely and accurate interim reports play in sustaining investor trust and enhancing transparency in the financial markets. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Ravi was excited to learn about IND AS36, impairment of assets. He had heard the term impairment in various discussions, but was unsure about its practical implications and how companies assess and report it. The professor, renowned for his engaging storytelling, decided to clarify this important topic using relatable real-life case studies. Imagine, Robbie, the professor began, you are working for a company called Evergreen Manufacturing Limited, which produces eco-friendly products. Recently, the company has faced challenges due to a sudden decline in demand for one of its major products. The question we need to explore is, how does IND AS36 guide the assessment and recognition of asset impairment in this scenario? Ravi leaned in, eager to grasp the concept. What exactly does impairment mean in this context? Great question, the professor replied. Impairment refers to a reduction in the recoverable amount of an asset below its carrying amount. When this happens, a company must recognize an impairment loss, which impacts its financial statements. Under INDAS 36, companies are required to assess assets for impairment whenever there are indications that the carrying amount may not be recoverable. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Tech Solutions Private. Limited, let's say Tech Solutions invested heavily in developing a new software product. After launching it, they noticed a sharp decline in user interest, leading to decreased sales. This assessment is crucial to determine whether an impairment loss needs to be recognized. Ravi nodded, starting to understand. So, the company needs to evaluate if the asset can generate future cash flows? Under INDAS 36, the recoverable amount is defined as the higher of an asset's fair value less cost to sell and its value in use. To determine this, Tech Solutions would estimate future cash flows generated by the software, discount them to present value, and compare them to the carrying amount. If the carrying amount exceeds the recoverable amount, an impairment loss must be recognized. The professor continued with the story of Global Industries. Global Industries owned a factory that was producing a line of products. Due to technological advancements, the equipment became outdated leading to increased maintenance costs and decreased production efficiency. The management observed that the factory's cash flows were declining and decided to perform an impairment test on the factory's assets. Global Industries calculated the recoverable amount of the factory's assets, the professor explained. After thorough analysis, they found that the fair value less cost to sell was lower than the carrying amount. As a result, they recognized an impairment loss 
which had a significant impact on their income statement and overall financial position. Robbie thought for a moment. Why is it important for companies to recognize impairment losses promptly? Excellent observation, Robbie, the professor replied. Timely recognition of impairment losses ensures that financial statements reflect the true value of a company's assets. Failing to do so can mislead stakeholders about the company's financial health. For example, if global industries did not recognize the impairment, it would present an inflated asset value, impacting investment decisions and potentially leading to regulatory scrutiny. To emphasize the importance of compliance with IND AS36, the professor shared a cautionary tale about Rapid Growth Limited. Rapid Growth owned several assets, including a real estate property. Due to a market downturn, the property's value plummeted, but the management chose to ignore the signs and did not conduct an impairment assessment. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, understanding and applying IND AS36 is crucial for maintaining transparency and trust with stakeholders? Absolutely, the professor confirmed. IND AS36 ensures that companies provide accurate information about asset values, allowing stakeholders to make informed decisions. Recognizing impairment losses not only reflects the true financial position, but also helps in strategic decision-making for the future. The professor's engaging stories about Evergreen Manufacturing Limited and Tech Solutions had made the complex topic of impairment of assets accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach financial reporting with confidence, appreciating the critical role that accurate impairment assessment plays in fostering transparency and maintaining trust in the financial markets. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Ravi was curious about IND AS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. While he had a basic understanding of these terms, he wanted to grasp their practical implications and how they affect a company's financial statements. The professor, known for his engaging storytelling, decided to clarify these concepts using real-life case studies that would resonate with Ravi. Imagine Ravi, the professor started, you are working for a company called Smart Tech Solutions, which specializes in innovative software development. Recently, the company has faced a potential lawsuit related to a software malfunction. This scenario raises the question, how does INDAS 37 guide the recognition and measurement of provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets? Robbie leaned forward, intrigued. What exactly are provisions and contingent liabilities? Great question, the professor replied. A provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount. Under INDAS 37, a provision should be recognized when there is a present obligation, legal or constructive, as a result of a past event, it is probable that an outflow of resources will be required to settle the obligation, and a reliable estimate can be made of the amount. In contrast, a contingent liability is a possible obligation that arises from past events and whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non-occurrence of one or more uncertain future events. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Future Innovations Private. The company estimates the costs associated with the recall, including refunds, repairs, and customer communication. Since there is a present obligation arising from the product safety issue, the company would recognize a provision for these estimated costs in its financial statements. Robbie nodded, beginning to understand. So, the provision reflects the expected costs associated with the obligation? Exactly, the professor confirmed. In this case, Future Innovations would create a provision on its balance sheet, ensuring that its financial position accurately reflects the expected outflow of resources. This recognition is essential for maintaining transparency with stakeholders. While the management believes that the lawsuit has little chance of success, it still raises a question about whether to recognize a provision for the legal costs. According to INDAS 37, since the outcome is uncertain, the company should assess the likelihood of the outflow of resources. If it is not probable, TechWorld would disclose the potential liability as a contingent liability in the notes to the financial statements instead of recognizing a provision. So, contingent liabilities are disclosed but not recognized on the balance sheet unless they meet specific criteria? Exactly, the professor replied. Imagine a scenario where innovative manufacturing has filed a lawsuit against a supplier for breach of contract. However, 
under INDAS 37, contingent assets are not recognized on the balance sheet until the realization of the income is virtually certain. Robbie thought for a moment. So, the treatment of contingent assets and liabilities ensures that financial statements are not misleading? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. The careful assessment and disclosure of provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets provide stakeholders with a clear picture of potential financial risks and rewards. This transparency is crucial for informed decision-making. To emphasize the importance of compliance with IND AS 37, the professor shared a cautionary tale about global industries. Global Industries had a significant ongoing legal dispute but chose not to disclose this as a contingent liability in its financial statements. Once the case was resolved, the financial impact was far greater than expected and stakeholders were left shocked by the sudden loss in value. The lack of transparency led to a loss of investor trust and a significant decline in stock prices. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So... Understanding and applying IND AS 37 is crucial for maintaining credibility and trust with stakeholders? Exactly, the professor confirmed. Recognizing provisions and disclosing contingent liabilities and assets is vital for fostering transparency and trust in the financial markets. As the class concluded, Robbie felt enlightened about IND AS 37. The professor's engaging stories about smart tech solutions and future innovations had made the complex topic of provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach financial reporting with confidence, appreciating the critical role that proper assessment and disclosure play in maintaining transparency and trust in the financial landscape. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Robbie was eager to delve into the topic of IND AS38, intangible assets. Imagine, Robbie, the professor started. You are working for a company called Creative Designs Private Limited, which specializes in creating innovative graphic designs and marketing strategies. Recently, the company developed a new branding strategy that has significantly enhanced its market presence. This scenario raises the question. How does IND AS 38 guide the recognition and measurement of intangible assets? Robbie leaned forward, intrigued. What qualifies as an intangible asset under this standard? Great question, the professor replied. Under IND AS 38, an intangible asset is defined as an identifiable non monetary asset without physical substance. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about innovative tech solutions. Let's say Innovative Tech Solutions developed a proprietary software application for managing supply chain processes. Since the software is unique, has a useful life beyond one year, and is expected to generate future economic benefits, it qualifies as an intangible asset. The company would recognize it on its balance sheet at cost, which includes all expenses directly attributable to preparing the asset for its intended use. Ravi nodded, beginning to understand. So. The costs incurred to develop the software can be capitalized? For instance, if innovative tech solutions can demonstrate the feasibility of completing the software, its intention to use it, and its ability to generate future economic benefits, then the development cost can be capitalized as an intangible asset. The professor then continued with a story about Digital Marketing Incorporated. Now, consider a situation where Digital Marketing Incorporated has developed a new marketing strategy that has led to a significant increase in client acquisition. This strategy is not a physical asset, but represents a valuable business opportunity. Instead, the costs associated with developing the marketing strategy would be expensed in the period incurred. Robbie thought for a moment. Absolutely, the professor affirmed. Moreover, once recognized, Intangible assets must be measured. If the software has a useful life of five years, the company would systematically amortize the cost over that period, impacting its income statement. To emphasize the importance of compliance with IND AS 38, the professor shared a cautionary tale about Tech Innovators Limited. Tech Innovators had a significant portfolio of patents. However, they neglected to assess the useful life of these intangible assets and continued to amortize them over an extended period. This oversight highlighted the importance of evaluating intangible assets regularly 
and ensuring that their carrying amounts reflect their fair value. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, understanding and applying IND AS38 is crucial for accurately reflecting a company's financial position. IND AS38 ensures that companies provide accurate information about intangible assets, allowing stakeholders to understand their true value. Recognizing and measuring intangible assets correctly is vital for maintaining transparency and trust with investors. As the class concluded, Robbie felt enlightened about INDAS 38. The professor's engaging stories about creative designs private, limited, and innovative tech solutions had made the complex topic of intangible assets accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Robbie was ready to approach financial reporting with confidence appreciating the critical role that proper recognition and measurement of intangible assets play in the overall financial landscape. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class started, Ravi was curious about INDAS 40, investment property. He understood that investment properties play a significant role in a company's financial health, but wanted to learn more about their recognition, measurement, and reporting through real-life examples. The professor, renowned for his storytelling skills, decided to clarify these concepts with relatable case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began. You are working for a real estate company called Urban Properties Limited. Recently, Urban Properties purchased a building with the intention of leasing it out to tenants. Ravi leaned in, intrigued. Great question, the professor replied. It is important to distinguish between investment properties and owner-occupied properties, which are used by the entity for its own operations. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Global Realty Incorporated. Let's say Global Realty acquired a commercial office space with the intention of leasing it to various businesses. Since this property is not used by Global Realty for its own operations, but is instead held to earn rental income, it qualifies as an investment property. Urban properties would recognize the property on its balance sheet at cost, which includes the purchase price and any directly attributable expenditure. Ravi nodded, starting to connect the dots. So, the costs incurred to acquire the property can be capitalized? Exactly, the professor confirmed. However, once recognized, the company must choose between two models for subsequent measurement, the cost model or the fair value model. Under the cost model, the investment property is carried at cost less any accumulated depreciation and impairment losses. Conversely, under the fair value model, the investment property is revalued at its fair market value at each reporting date, with changes in value recognized in profit or loss. The professor then continued with a story about heritage developers. Imagine heritage developers owns a residential building that it leases out. The company decides to apply the fair value model for its investment properties. As the real estate market appreciates, heritage developers regularly updates the fair value of its property. Any increase in value is recognized in profit or loss, impacting the company's financial performance positively. Robbie thought for a moment. Absolutely, the professor affirmed. However, there are also implications for companies that choose the cost model. To further emphasize the application of IND AS40, the professor shared a cautionary tale about future estates private. Limited, future estates had a mixed-use property that generated both rental income and was partially occupied for its own operations. However, they incorrectly classified the entire property as investment property. When auditors flagged this issue, future estates faced significant restatements of their financial statements. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, understanding and applying IND AS40 is crucial for accurately reflecting a company's financial position and performance. Exactly, the professor confirmed. IND AS40 ensures that companies provide transparent information about their investment properties, allowing stakeholders to understand their impact on financial performance. Correct classification, measurement, and reporting of investment properties are vital for maintaining transparency and trust with investors. As the class concluded, Robbie felt enlightened about IND AS40. The professor's engaging stories about Urban Properties Limited and Global Realty Incorporated had made the complex topic of investment properties accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach financial reporting with confidence, 
appreciating the critical role that proper recognition and measurement of investment properties play in the overall financial landscape. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Robbie was eager to explore IND AS41, agriculture. He understood that this standard had unique applications, especially in industries reliant on agricultural produce, but he wanted to grasp its nuances through real-life examples. The professor, celebrated for his storytelling ability, decided to make the topic engaging by weaving in relatable case studies. Imagine, Robbie, the professor started, you are working for a company called Greenfields Agro Limited. This company specializes in growing various crops, including rice, wheat, and vegetables. Today, we will discuss how IND AS41 governs the recognition and measurement of biological assets and agricultural produce. Ravi leaned in intrigued. What exactly are biological assets under this standard? Excellent question, the professor replied. According to IND AS41, Biological assets are living animals or plants. For example, if Greenfields Agro Limited cultivates a field of wheat, the wheat plants themselves are classified as biological assets until they are harvested. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Harvest Green Farms. Let's say Harvest Green Farms grows apples. According to IND AS41, the company must measure its apple trees at fair value less cost to sell. If the market conditions indicate that the apples are expected to sell for a high price this season, the fair value of the apple trees will also increase. This increase in value reflects the potential economic benefits of the crop and must be recognized in the financial statements. So, the biological assets are recorded at their fair value rather than historical cost? Exactly, the professor confirmed. This approach allows for a more accurate reflection of the asset's value in financial statements. However, it is important to note that when the apples are harvested, they are no longer considered biological assets. Instead, they are reclassified as inventory and measured at the lower of cost or net realizable value. The professor then continued with a story about Agro Innovations Limited. Now, consider a situation where Agro Innovations Limited raises cattle for dairy production. When the company assesses its livestock, it measures the animals at fair value. However, if one of the cows gives birth to a calf, that calf is also considered a biological asset and must be valued as well. Each calf will be recognized separately, and as they mature, their fair value will change, reflecting their growth and the potential milk they can produce. Robbie thought for a moment. So, tracking the fair value of biological assets can be quite dynamic due to growth and market conditions? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. However, IND AS41 also requires disclosures about the methods and assumptions used in measuring fair value. For instance, Harvest Green Farms would need to disclose how it determines the fair value of its apple trees, including any significant judgments made. When investors realize the discrepancies, the company faced scrutiny and a decline in investor confidence, resulting in a loss of market value. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, understanding and applying IND AS41 is crucial for accurately reflecting the value of biological assets and ensuring transparency with stakeholders. Proper recognition, measurement, and disclosure are vital for maintaining trust with investors and ensuring the sustainability of agricultural operations. As the class concluded, Robbie felt enlightened about IND AS41. The professor's engaging stories about Greenfields Agro Limited and Harvest Green Farms had made the complex topic of agriculture accounting accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Robbie was ready to approach financial reporting in the agricultural sector with confidence appreciating the critical role that proper recognition and measurement of biological assets play in the overall financial landscape. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Robbie was curious about IND AS 101, first-time adoption of Indian accounting standards. He understood that transitioning to IND as from another accounting framework could be challenging, but he wanted to learn about its practical application through real-life examples. The professor, well known for his captivating storytelling, decided to illustrate the complexities of this standard using relatable case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began, you are working for a company called Tech Innovations Private. 
Now, due to regulatory changes, Tech Innovations is preparing to transition to INDAS for the first time. This scenario raises the question, how does INDAS 101 guide the adoption process? Ravi leaned in, eager to learn. What are the main objectives of INDAS 101? Excellent question, the professor replied. INDAS 101 provides guidance for entities adopting INDAS for the first time. Its primary objectives are to ensure that an entity's first financial statements prepared under IND as contain high-quality information that is transparent, comparable, and understandable. The standard also aims to reduce the burden of transitioning by providing certain exemptions. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Legacy Manufacturing Limited. Let's say Legacy Manufacturing was previously using the Indian Gap and now decides to adopt INDAS. Under INDAS 101, the company must prepare an opening INDAS balance sheet at the date of transition. This balance sheet reflects the company's assets and liabilities as if it had always been applying INDAS, except for certain permitted exceptions. So, they must essentially restate their previous financial statements as if they had been using INDAS from the beginning? Exactly, the professor confirmed. For instance, Legacy manufacturing may have previously recorded its property, plant, and equipment at historical cost. Under INDAS 101, they can choose to measure these assets at fair value on the date of transition and use that fair value as the deemed cost in their opening INDAS balance sheet. This approach can significantly affect their reported financial position. The professor then continued with a story about new era technologies. Consider new era technologies which had a significant amount of intangible assets that were previously recognized under Indian Gap. Upon transitioning to IND as, they have the option to either measure these intangible assets at their carrying amounts or at fair value on the date of transition. Robbie thought for a moment. So, there are strategic decisions to be made during the transition process? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. However, it is important to note that INDAS 101 also emphasizes the need for comprehensive disclosures in the first set of INDAS financial statements. New era technologies would need to disclose the impact of the transition on their financial position and performance, including how they applied the exemptions available under the standard. To highlight the importance of these disclosures, the professor shared a cautionary tale about old school electronics. Old School Electronics transitioned to INDAS but failed to adequately disclose the reasons for their accounting policy choices and the impact on their financial statements. As a result, investors were confused about the differences between their old and new financial statements. This lack of transparency led to skepticism regarding their financial health, impacting their stock price negatively. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, Understanding and applying INDAS 101 is crucial for a smooth transition and for maintaining stakeholder confidence? Exactly, the professor confirmed. Proper recognition, measurement, and disclosure are vital for fostering transparency and trust with investors. As the class concluded, Ravi felt enlightened about INDAS 101. The professor's engaging stories about tech innovations private. Limited and Legacy Manufacturing Limited had made the complex topic of first-time adoption accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach the challenges of transitioning to IND as with confidence, appreciating the critical role that proper implementation and disclosure play in the overall financial landscape. He knew that this standard addressed the accounting for share-based payment arrangements, but he wanted to understand its practical implications through real-life examples. Imagine, Ravi, the professor started, you are working for a technology company called Innovate Tech Solutions. This company wants to attract and retain talented employees by offering them share-based payments, such as stock options. Understanding INDAS 102 is crucial for Innovate Tech to appropriately account for these arrangements. How does INDAS 102 define share-based payment? Great question, the professor replied. Under INDAS 102, Share-based payment refers to transactions in which an entity receives goods or services as consideration for equity instruments, or incurs liabilities to pay for goods or services based on the price of its equity instruments. For instance, if Innovate Tech grants stock options to its employees, 
These options are considered share-based payments. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Creative Designs Limited. Let's say Creative Designs grants its employees the option to purchase shares at a fixed price after a certain vesting period. According to INDAS 102, the company must measure the fair value of these options at the grant date and recognize this value as an expense over the vesting period. This accounting treatment reflects the cost of the employee services received. Ravi nodded, beginning to comprehend the accounting implications. Exactly, the professor confirmed. If the options vest over four years, Creative Designs would recognize 2,500 rupees as an expense each year. The professor then continued with a story about Tech Innovations Incorporated. Now, consider Tech Innovations, which also offers share-based payments, but with a performance condition. In this case, if employees must meet specific performance targets to earn their stock options, INDAS 102 requires the company to estimate the number of options expected to vest based on the likelihood of achieving these performance conditions. If the estimate changes during the vesting period, the company must adjust the expense accordingly. Ravi thought for a moment. So, companies must continuously evaluate the likelihood of achieving performance targets and adjust their expense recognition? Exactly, the professor affirmed. This ongoing assessment ensures that the financial statements accurately reflect the cost of employee services based on the actual performance. To emphasize the importance of these disclosures, the professor shared a cautionary tale about Global Tech Corporation. Global Tech Corporation had an extensive share-based payment plan, but failed to provide clear disclosures regarding the assumptions used in measuring fair value. When their financial statements were scrutinized by investors, the lack of transparency raised questions about the company's financial health and led to a decline in investor confidence. Robbie felt the weight of the lesson. So, Understanding and applying INDAS 102 is crucial for accurately reflecting the cost of share-based payments and maintaining transparency with stakeholders? Exactly, the professor confirmed. INDAS 102 enables companies to provide meaningful information about the financial effects of share-based payments, fostering trust and confidence among investors. Proper recognition, measurement, and disclosure are vital for ensuring that stakeholders understand the costs associated with share-based payment arrangements. As the class concluded, Ravi felt enlightened about INDAS 102. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach accounting for share-based payments with confidence, appreciating the critical role that proper implementation and disclosure play in the overall financial landscape. Share, subscribe, like, comment. The professor, renowned for his captivating storytelling, was ready to illuminate this subject with engaging case studies. Imagine, Ravi, the professor began, you are working for a company called Smart Solutions Private. Limited. This company is considering acquiring another company, Innovate Tech Limited, to expand its product offerings and market reach. Understanding INDAS 103 is crucial for Smart Solutions to appropriately account for this business combination. Ravi leaned in, eager to learn. What does IND as 103 say about business combinations? Excellent question, the professor replied. IND AS 103 provides guidance on accounting for business combinations. The core principle is that an acquirer must identify the acquiree, determine the acquisition date, and recognize the identifiable assets acquired, the liabilities assumed, and any non controlling interest in the acquiree. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Visionary Technologies. Let's say Visionary Technologies acquired Creative Innovations Incorporated for a substantial amount. On the acquisition date, Visionary must assess the fair value of the assets and liabilities of Creative Innovations. This includes tangible assets like property and equipment, as well as intangible assets like patents and customer relationships. Robbie nodded, starting to understand the process. So, they need to evaluate everything at fair value. If Visionary determined that the fair value of Creative Innovations assets was 50 million rupees and the liabilities were 20 million rupees, they would recognize a net identifiable asset of 30 million rupees. Additionally, if Visionary paid 70 million rupees for the acquisition, the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of the net identifiable assets would be recorded as goodwill. 
The professor continued with a case study involving Global Dynamics Limited. Imagine Global Dynamics acquired next-gen solutions and identified significant synergies expected from the combination. According to INDAS 103, the acquirer must not recognize any future synergies as assets, but they can reflect these synergies in the valuation of goodwill. This is crucial as goodwill represents the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of net identifiable assets. Ravi pondered for a moment. However, it is important to note that IND as 103 also requires the acquirer to reassess the classification and measurement of any contingent liabilities acquired in the business combination. If Global Dynamics had acquired contingent liabilities, they would need to evaluate the likelihood and timing of any potential outflows to determine how to account for them. Later, they discovered significant legal claims against the startup that were not accounted for in the acquisition. This oversight led to substantial financial losses and legal issues, impacting Evergreen's reputation and investor trust. Ravi felt the weight of this lesson. So, understanding and applying INDAS. 103 is vital for accurately reflecting the financial implications of business combinations. INDAS 103 ensures that companies provide a clear picture of the financial effects of business combinations, allowing stakeholders to understand the rationale behind the acquisition and its expected benefits. Proper recognition, measurement, and disclosure are essential for maintaining transparency and trust with investors. As the class concluded, Ravi felt enlightened about INDAS 103. The professor's engaging stories about smart solutions private. Limited and visionary technologies had made the complex topic of business combinations accessible and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach accounting for business combinations with confidence, appreciating the critical role that proper implementation and disclosure play in the financial landscape of businesses. Share, subscribe, like, comment. He understood that insurance accounting was complex and often challenging, but he was eager to grasp the concepts through practical examples. Understanding INDAS 104 is essential for accurately accounting for insurance contracts and ensuring compliance with regulatory standards. Ravi listened intently. What does INDAS 104 entail in terms of insurance contracts? Great question, the professor replied enthusiastically. INDAS 104 outlines the principles for recognizing, measuring, and disclosing insurance contracts. It applies to all types of insurance contracts, including life, health, and non-life insurance. The core principle is that insurers must assess their liabilities for insurance contracts based on the expected cash flows, which includes premiums received and claims expected to be paid. To illustrate this, the professor shared a story about Family Guard Insurance Company. Consider Family Guard, which offers life insurance policies. When a policyholder purchases a policy, Family Guard receives premiums, which it must recognize as income over the policy term. However, they also need to estimate future claims that they expect to pay out. This requires careful analysis of historical data, mortality rates, and economic conditions. So, they have to balance the premiums collected against the expected claims to determine their financial position. Exactly, the professor confirmed. For instance, if Family Guard estimates that it will receive 5 million rupees in premiums but expects to pay out 2 million rupees in claims over the policy term, they would recognize a liability of 2 million rupees on their balance sheet to cover future claims. This liability reflects the present value of expected future outflows related to the insurance contracts. The professor continued with a story about Protect Plus Insurance. Now, let's say Protect Plus offers health insurance plans with various coverages. Under IND AS 104, insurers must also account for any reinsurance contracts they have in place. For example, if Protect Plus purchases reinsurance to limit its exposure to large claims, they must assess how the reinsurance affects their liabilities and recognize any recoverables separately. Ravi interjected. So, if Protect Plus has a reinsurance contract that covers claims above a certain threshold, they would recognize a reinsurance asset as part of their accounting. This is crucial for accurately reflecting the insurer's net position. 
Furthermore, INDAS 104 requires disclosures that help users of the financial statements understand the nature and extent of risks arising from insurance contracts, including how those risks are managed. To emphasize the importance of transparency, the professor recounted a cautionary tale about Visionary Insurance Group. Visionary Insurance expanded rapidly, but faced challenges due to inadequate disclosures about the risks associated with their insurance products. Investors and regulators raised concerns when they discovered that Visionary had significant exposure to high-risk policies without proper risk management strategies in place. This situation eroded investor confidence and negatively impacted their market value. Robbie considered this carefully. So, the proper application of INDAS 104 is not only about financial accuracy, but also about maintaining trust and transparency with stakeholders. By providing clear and comprehensive disclosures, insurers can foster trust and ensure that stakeholders understand the financial implications of insurance contracts. This clarity is essential for effective decision-making and regulatory compliance. As the class concluded, Robbie felt empowered by the insights he had gained regarding INDAS 104. The professor's engaging stories about Secure Future Insurance Limited and Family Guard Insurance had made the complex world of insurance accounting more approachable and relevant. With this newfound knowledge, Robbie was ready to tackle insurance contracts with confidence, recognizing the significance of proper accounting and transparency in fostering trust within the financial landscape of the insurance industry. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Robbie felt a mix of anticipation and curiosity about the day's topic. INDAS 105, non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. He had heard that this area of accounting could be quite intricate, and he was eager to gain insights through practical examples. Picture this, Robbie, the professor began, leaning forward with enthusiasm. You are working for a company called Future Innovations Limited, which has decided to restructure its operations. Robbie's interest peaked. What does INDAS 105 cover? Excellent question, the professor replied. INDAS 105 specifies how to account for non-current assets held for sale and how to report discontinued operations. The key concept is that a non-current asset must be classified as held for sale when its carrying amount will be recovered primarily through a sale transaction rather than through continued use. To qualify, the asset must be available for immediate sale, and its sale must be highly probable. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Tech Savvy Solutions. Imagine Tech Savvy Solutions has decided to sell one of its subsidiaries, Gadget World, which has been underperforming. Upon making this decision, Tech Savvy must assess whether the assets associated with Gadget World meet the criteria to be classified as held for sale. If the management plans to sell these assets within a year, they must evaluate their carrying amounts and ensure they are measured at the lower of their carrying amount or fair value less cost to sell. Robbie nodded thoughtfully. So, if Gadget World's assets are valued at 20 million rupees, but the estimated fair value less cost to sell is 15 million rupees, Tech Savvy must adjust the carrying amount to reflect the lower value? This adjustment ensures that the financial statements accurately reflect the potential recovery from the sale of the assets. Moreover, the company must disclose the nature of the assets held for sale, the circumstances surrounding the sale, and any financial impacts. The professor continued with a real-life example involving Heritage Foods Limited. Let's say Heritage Foods decided to discontinue its dairy products division due to declining market demand. Under INDAS 105, they would need to classify the assets associated with that division as discontinued operations. This classification allows the company to provide clearer financial information about its ongoing operations. Exactly, the professor confirmed. Heritage Foods would present the results of the dairy division separately, showing any losses incurred from the discontinuation. This helps investors and stakeholders understand how the company's core operations are performing without the impact of the discontinued segment. To emphasize the importance of proper classification, the professor shared a cautionary tale about Innovative Manufacturing Incorporated. Innovative Manufacturing faced challenges when it decided to sell off a segment of its business. However, they failed to properly classify the assets as held for sale, 
which led to confusion in their financial statements. Investors were misled about the company's financial health, and this ultimately resulted in a loss of trust and a decline in stock prices. Robbie reflected on this story. So, applying IND AS 105 accurately is crucial for transparency and maintaining investor confidence? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. This clarity is essential for stakeholders to make informed decisions and understand the true performance of the company. As the class came to a close, Robbie felt a newfound appreciation for IND AS 105. The professor's engaging stories about future innovations limited in tech-savvy solutions had made the complexities of non-current assets and discontinued operations accessible and relatable. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class began, Robbie settled into his seat with a sense of curiosity about today's topic. INDAS 106, Exploration for an Evaluation of Mineral Resources He had always found the accounting of natural resources fascinating, but he was eager to learn how this standard applied in the real world. The professor, known for his captivating storytelling, was ready to bring this subject to life through practical examples. Imagine this, Ravi, the professor began, a twinkle in his eye. You are working for a mining company called Earthworks Limited, which specializes in the exploration and evaluation of mineral resources. Understanding IND AS 106 is essential for accurately accounting for the costs associated with exploration and evaluation activities. Ravi listened intently, eager to grasp the intricacies of this standard. What does IND AS 106 entail? The standard applies to activities involving the search for mineral resources, such as oil, gas, and minerals, until a project is determined to be commercially viable. To illustrate this, the professor shared a story about GeoResources Limited. Consider GeoResources, which has invested in a large tract of land to explore for oil. During the exploration phase, the company incurs significant costs, such as drilling, geological surveys, and sampling. Under INDAS 106, these costs are capitalized as exploration and evaluation assets until the technical feasibility and commercial viability of extracting the resource are established. Ravi interjected, So, if GeoResources spends 50 million rupees on drilling and related activities, they would recognize this amount as an asset on their balance sheet? However, if GeoResources determines that the exploration results are not commercially viable, they must write off the costs. This reflects the principle that expenditures should only be capitalized if there is a reasonable expectation of future economic benefits. To provide a clearer picture, the professor shared a real-life case involving Mineral Ventures Private. Limited, Mineral Ventures invested heavily in exploring a potential gold mine. After several years of exploration, they discovered a significant deposit, which they believed to be commercially viable. They then transitioned from exploration and evaluation to development and production. At this point, they had to apply the principles of INDAS 106 to reclassify their exploration and evaluation assets into tangible assets for production. Precisely, the professor said, this transition is crucial because it ensures that the financial statements accurately reflect the nature of the company's assets and the stage of their operations. It also sets the foundation for further accounting standards that apply once the resources are in production. To emphasize the importance of accurate reporting, the professor recounted a cautionary tale about Terra Mining Corporation. Terra Mining faced scrutiny after their exploration costs were questioned. They had failed to properly disclose their evaluation process, leading to ambiguity about the potential viability of their mineral resources. This lack of transparency resulted in a loss of investor confidence and legal challenges. Ravi considered the implications. So, proper application of IND AS 106 is essential not just for compliance, but also for maintaining transparency and trust with stakeholders? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. By accurately capitalizing and disclosing exploration costs, companies provide a clearer picture of their financial health and the potential future value of their mineral resources. As the class drew to a close, Robbie felt empowered by the insights he had gained regarding IND AS 106.
The professor's engaging stories about Earthworks Limited and Geo Resources had made the complexities of mineral resource accounting relatable and understandable. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As the accounting class commenced, Ravi felt a surge of excitement about today's topic. INDAS 107, Financial Instruments, Disclosures. The professor, renowned for his captivating storytelling, was ready to make this subject engaging through practical examples. You are interning at a company called Smart Finance Limited, which specializes in investment management. Ravi leaned in, eager to absorb the details. What does INDAS 107 entail? Great question, the professor replied. INDAS 107 outlines the disclosure requirements for financial instruments. This includes information about the significance of financial instruments for the entity's financial position and performance and the nature and extent of risks arising from those financial instruments. The goal is to provide stakeholders with a transparent view of the financial risks that a company faces. To illustrate, the professor shared a story about Global Investments Corporation. Imagine Global Investments, which holds various financial instruments, including stocks, bonds, and derivatives. This helps users of the financial statements understand the composition of the company's financial position. Ravi nodded thoughtfully. Exactly, the professor confirmed. To provide a clearer understanding, the professor shared a real-life example involving Diverse Holdings Limited. Diverse Holdings had significant investments in foreign currency derivatives. Under INDAS 107, they needed to disclose their exposure to foreign currency risk, including the nature of the derivatives, the objectives of holding them, and the potential impact on their financial position. This information is essential for stakeholders who want to gauge the company's risk management strategies. Ravi interjected. So, if Diverse Holdings is exposed to fluctuations in currency exchange rates, they must provide detailed disclosures about how those fluctuations could affect their financial results? Exactly, the professor affirmed. This kind of disclosure helps investors understand the potential risks involved and make informed decisions. Additionally, the company must disclose any changes in the fair value of financial instruments and how these changes are recognized in profit or loss. To emphasize the importance of proper disclosure, the professor recounted a cautionary tale about Equity Partners Limited. Equity Partners faced criticism when it failed to provide adequate disclosures about its financial instruments. Investors were left in the dark regarding the company's exposure to credit risk and liquidity risk. This lack of transparency led to a decline in investor confidence and a drop in stock prices. Ravi reflected on this story. So, the application of INDAS 107 is not just about compliance. It's about building trust and confidence with stakeholders? Absolutely, the professor replied. Accurate and comprehensive disclosures regarding financial instruments are essential for maintaining transparency in financial reporting. This allows investors, creditors, and other stakeholders to make informed decisions based on a clear understanding of the risks and returns associated with the company's financial instruments. The professor's engaging stories about smart finance limited and global investments had made the complexities of financial instrument disclosures relatable and understandable. Share, subscribe, like, comment. As Ravi settled into his seat for another session in his accounting class, he was particularly eager about the day's topic. INDAS 107, Financial Instruments, Disclosures. He knew that financial instruments played a significant role in a company's financial health, and he was ready to learn how proper disclosures could illuminate their impact on financial statements. The professor, known for his storytelling prowess, was ready to weave a compelling narrative around this important subject. Imagine this scenario, Ravi, the professor began, his voice filled with enthusiasm. You are working at a thriving tech startup called Innovatech Solutions. This company has been successful in raising capital through various financial instruments, including loans, bonds, and equity financing. Understanding IND AS 107 will be crucial for ensuring transparency in the financial statements. Ravi perked up, intrigued. What exactly does INDAS 107 require from us? INDAS 107 outlines the disclosure requirements for financial instruments. It requires companies to provide relevant information about the significance of financial instruments for their financial position and performance, as well as the nature and extent of risks associated with them. 
The purpose is to enable users of financial statements to assess the risk exposure and the financial stability of the company. To illustrate this, the professor shared a story about a well-known company, TechTrend Incorporated. Consider TechTrend, which has a diverse portfolio of financial instruments. They must disclose not only the carrying amounts of these instruments, but also the methods and assumptions used in estimating their fair value. For instance, if TechTrend has investments in various stocks, they need to show how they arrive at the fair value of those stocks, especially if market prices are not readily available. Robbie nodded, visualizing the implications. Exactly, the professor confirmed. Furthermore, they must disclose any risks associated with these financial instruments. For example, if TechTrend is exposed to interest rate risk because of its floating rate loans, they should provide information on how this risk could impact their financial results. To drive the point home, the professor shared a real-life case study involving Global Corporation. Global Corporation had significant investments in foreign currencies and derivatives. Under IND AS 107, they needed to disclose their exposure to foreign exchange risk, including the nature of their currency derivatives and the potential impact on their profits. By providing this information, they enabled stakeholders to understand the financial risks associated with their operations. Robbie was intrigued. Precisely, the professor affirmed. Moreover, companies must disclose any significant changes in the fair value of financial instruments during the reporting period and how those changes are recognized in the profit or loss statement. To highlight the consequences of inadequate disclosure, the professor recounted a cautionary tale about Equity Holdings Limited. Equity Holdings faced severe backlash when it failed to disclose its exposure to credit risk adequately. Investors were blindsided when the company defaulted on a loan, leading to a sharp decline in stock prices. Ravi reflected on this example, understanding the weight of the lesson. So, the application of INDAS 107 is not just about compliance. It's about ensuring transparency and fostering trust with investors and stakeholders. Accurate and thorough disclosures regarding financial instruments empower stakeholders to make informed decisions, enhancing the credibility of the financial statements and the company as a whole. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi was prepared to approach the intricacies of financial instrument disclosures with confidence, recognizing the vital role transparency plays in shaping the financial landscape and building lasting trust with stakeholders. As the sun streamed through the classroom windows, Ravi settled into his seat. Eager for today's lesson on INDAS 108, Operating Segments. The professor, celebrated for his storytelling ability, was ready to make this seemingly complex topic come alive through real-life case studies. Let's start with a story, shall we, Ravi? The professor began, his eyes sparkling with enthusiasm. Imagine you are working at a multinational conglomerate called Global Enterprises. This company operates in various sectors including technology, consumer goods, and healthcare. Understanding IND AS 108 will be essential for providing insights into how these segments perform. Robbie leaned in, captivated. What exactly does IND AS 108 require? Great question, the professor replied. IND AS 108 requires entities to disclose information about their operating segments which are components of the entity that engage in business activities from which they earn revenues and incur expenses. The key is that these segments should be reported based on the internal reports that are regularly reviewed by the entity's chief operating decision maker. To illustrate, the professor introduced a real-world example involving Tech Innovators Limited. Consider Tech Innovators, which operates in both software development and hardware manufacturing. Under INDAS 108, they must disclose financial information separately for each of these segments. By doing this, stakeholders can better understand which segment is performing well and which is not. Robbie nodded, processing the information. So, if Tech Innovators has generated 70 million rupees from software and 50 million from hardware, they need to present these figures separately. Exactly, the professor confirmed. This disclosure helps investors assess the performance of each segment, enabling them to make more informed decisions. For instance, if investors see that the software segment is consistently outperforming the hardware segment, they might decide to invest more based on that insight. To further clarify, 
the professor shared a cautionary tale about Diverse Industries Corporation. Diverse Industries had multiple operating segments, including textiles and agriculture. However, when they reported their financials, they lumped all revenues and expenses together without clear segmentation. This lack of clarity frustrated investors and analysts, as they couldn't identify which business units were thriving or struggling. Consequently, the company faced a drop in its stock price due to a loss of investor confidence. Ravi interjected. So, the application of INDAS 108 is not just a regulatory requirement. It's a way to build transparency and trust with stakeholders? Exactly, the professor replied, nodding approvingly. Moreover, INDAS 108 also requires companies to disclose the factors used to identify their operating segments, including how they measure segment profit or loss. This is important because it provides context for the financial results, allowing stakeholders to understand how decisions are made at the management level. The professor continued, Take the example of food and beverage group. They might have separate segments for beverages, snacks, and frozen foods. If management decides to allocate resources differently among these segments, they must disclose these changes and the reasons behind them. This level of transparency is vital for maintaining trust with investors and regulators alike. Ravi absorbed this information, realizing the profound implications of segment reporting. So, a company that effectively communicates its segment performance can enhance its market reputation and attract more investors? Absolutely the professor affirmed. By providing detailed disclosures about operating segments, companies can better inform their stakeholders about their business strategies, performance, and risk exposure. This, in turn, helps in fostering a more robust relationship with investors. As the lesson came to an end, Ravi felt a newfound appreciation for INDS 108. The professor's engaging storytelling about global enterprises and tech innovators had transformed what could have been a dry topic into a captivating narrative. Armed with this knowledge, Ravi was ready to approach the complexities of operating segment disclosures with confidence, understanding their critical role in enhancing transparency and building trust within the financial community. Share, subscribe, like, comment. Today's topic was INDAS 109, Financial Instruments. The professor, known for his engaging storytelling style, was prepared to illuminate this complex subject through real-life examples that would resonate with the students. Let's embark on a journey today, shall we, Ravi? The professor began, his voice lively. Imagine you are working at a large financial institution called Fortune Bank. This bank deals with a wide array of financial instruments, from loans and deposits to complex derivatives. Understanding INDAS 109 is essential for ensuring that the bank accurately measures and reports its financial instruments. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. What does INDAS 109 actually require us to do? Excellent question, the professor replied. INDAS 109 provides a comprehensive framework for the classification, measurement, and impairment of financial instruments. It categorizes these instruments into three main categories. Financial assets measured at amortized cost, financial assets measured at fair value through other comprehensive income, and financial assets measured at fair value through profit or loss. To bring this to life, the professor recounted a real-world scenario involving fintech solutions. Imagine fintech solutions, a technology firm that provides financial services. They have a mix of financial assets including loans given to customers and investments in equity securities. Robbie furrowed his brow, trying to grasp the details. So, if FinTech Solutions issues a loan that is expected to be repaid over time, they would classify that loan as a financial asset measured at amortized cost? Exactly, the professor confirmed. By doing so, FinTech Solutions can recognize interest income on a systematic basis over the life of the loan. To further clarify, the professor shared a cautionary tale involving Global Investments Limited. Global Investments had a portfolio of financial instruments but failed to properly classify them under INDAS 109. When auditors reviewed their statements, they discovered significant discrepancies, leading to a loss of credibility in the market and a sharp decline in their stock price. Precisely, the professor replied, nodding approvingly. 
Moreover, INDAS 109 also outlines how to measure these financial instruments. For example, financial assets measured at fair value must reflect current market prices. In contrast, those measured at amortized costs should be valued using an effective interest rate method. Robbie contemplated this. What about the impairment aspect? How does that work under IND AS 109? Great question, the professor said, smiling. For instance, if Fortune Bank has a portfolio of loans, they must assess the credit risk associated with these loans and estimate expected losses over the life of the assets. This proactive approach helps ensure that the bank is prepared for potential defaults, promoting financial stability. They had to assess the credit risk of their receivables under IND AS 109. By evaluating expected credit losses, they could provide a more accurate picture of their financial health, which helped investors understand the potential impact on future earnings. Ravi nodded, realizing the implications of this framework. So, adopting IND AS 109 not only ensures compliance, but also enhances the transparency and reliability of financial reporting, allowing stakeholders to make informed decisions. By properly classifying, measuring, and assessing impairments of financial instruments, companies can foster trust with investors and other stakeholders, ultimately contributing to a more stable financial environment. As the class came to a close, Robbie felt enlightened by the insights he had gained about INDAS 109. With this newfound understanding, Robbie was ready to approach the intricacies of financial instruments with confidence, recognizing their critical role in shaping financial statements and maintaining investor trust. Today, they were diving into IND AS 110, Consolidated Financial Statements. The professor, well known for his captivating storytelling style, was ready to make this intricate subject come alive through real-life examples. Good morning, class. The professor greeted them with a warm smile. Today, we'll explore IND AS 110 through the story of a fictional company called Unity Group. Let's imagine you are working as a financial analyst at Unity Group, which owns several subsidiaries in different industries. Robbie settled in, eager to learn. What does IND AS 110 actually cover, Professor? IND AS 110 outlines the requirements for preparing consolidated financial statements when an entity controls one or more other entities. Under IND AS 110, Unity Group must prepare consolidated financial statements that combine the financial results of both subsidiaries with its own. This provides a complete picture of the group's financial position and performance. Ravi listened intently. So, if tech innovations generated 50 million rupees in revenue and EcoBuilders brought in 30 million, Unity Group would report a total revenue of 80 million rupees in its consolidated financial statements. Exactly, the professor confirmed nodding approvingly. This consolidated view allows stakeholders to see the overall performance of the group, rather than just looking at the individual entities in isolation. It provides a clearer picture of the economic activities of the entire group. To deepen Ravi's understanding, the professor recounted a cautionary tale about a company called Global Holdings. Global Holdings, much like Unity Group, owned multiple subsidiaries. However, they failed to consolidate the financial statements of a subsidiary where they had significant influence, but did not control. As a result, their financial reports were misleading, leading to a decline in investor confidence and a significant drop in stock prices. Ravi frowned. So, it's crucial to determine which entities need to be consolidated to avoid misrepresentation? Precisely, the professor affirmed. In addition to control, IND AS 110 specifies that all subsidiaries must be fully consolidated, including the financial results and position of each entity. This includes all assets, liabilities, income, and expenses, eliminating intercompany transactions to avoid double counting. Could you explain how intercompany transactions work? Robbie asked, intrigued. Of course, the professor said. Imagine Unity Group sells equipment to tech innovations at a profit. If this profit is not eliminated during consolidation, it would inflate the group's income. Under IND AS 110, such transactions must be adjusted to present a fair view of the group's financial performance. The professor continued with another example involving Retail Ventures, a retail conglomerate that owns several chains. 
When preparing consolidated financial statements, they must measure these assets and liabilities at fair value. This miscalculation led to inaccurate financial reporting, which eventually caught the attention of regulators. So, proper recognition of assets and liabilities is key to ensuring the integrity of the consolidated financial statements? Exactly, the professor replied. This helps investors understand the extent of control and the financial performance attributable to those interests. As the class drew to a close, Robbie felt enlightened by the insights he had gained about IND AS110. The professor's engaging narratives about Unity Group and Global Holdings had transformed a complex topic into an accessible and relatable one. Armed with this knowledge, Robbie was ready to approach the intricacies of consolidated financial statements with confidence, understanding their essential role in providing a true and fair view of a group's financial position and performance. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In a lively classroom filled with eager students, Robbie sat at the front, ready to absorb the intricacies of INDS 111 joint arrangements. The renowned professor, known for his captivating storytelling, stood at the front with a bright smile, ready to bring the concepts to life. Good morning, everyone. Today, we will delve into the world of joint arrangements through an engaging story. The professor began, his voice resonating with enthusiasm. Let's meet Ravi, a budding accountant, and his friend Aisha, who have just embarked on an exciting journey together. What kind of journey, Professor? Ravi and Aisha decided to open a bakery called Sweet Harmony as a joint venture. They pooled their resources and shared their expertise to create delightful treats for their community, the professor explained. So, how does INDAS 111 apply in this case? Great question, the professor replied. In the case of Sweet Harmony, they have formed a joint venture because they have established a separate legal entity, a limited liability partnership, to operate the bakery. Robbie's eyes widened as he connected the dots. So, does that mean they will prepare separate financial statements for the joint venture? Precisely, the professor said, nodding approvingly. Under IND AS 111, joint ventures are accounted for using the equity method. This means that Ravi and Aisha will include their share of the joint venture's profits or losses in their own financial statements. For instance, if Sweet Harmony earns a profit of 2 million rupees, Ravi and Aisha would recognize 1 million rupees each in their financial statements. To illustrate further, the professor shared a real-life case study of a company called Tech Alliance. Tech Alliance was formed between two technology companies. Innovatech and FutureTech to develop cutting edge software solutions. They created a separate entity, Tech Solutions, which operated as a joint venture. Ravi was eager to know more. What happened next, Professor? Tech Alliance faced challenges when it came to recognizing their share of profits, the professor explained. Initially, they failed to account for the losses incurred during the development phase. As a result, their financial statements were misleading. Under IND AS 111, it is crucial to account for both profits and losses appropriately to reflect the true financial position of each party involved. Ravi nodded, understanding the importance of accurate reporting. So, transparency is vital when accounting for joint arrangements? Absolutely, the professor affirmed. Furthermore, IND AS 111 requires that all parties involved disclose relevant information about the joint arrangement, including the nature of the relationship, the financial results, and any contingent liabilities. This helps stakeholders understand the extent of risks associated with the joint venture. The professor continued with another example involving a well-known construction firm, BuildRight. BuildRight partnered with another company, Green Projects, to undertake a large-scale infrastructure project. They decided to form a joint operation, where they both maintained control and shared the profits and costs of the project. What does that mean for their financial reporting? In a joint operation, each party recognizes their share of the assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses in their financial statements, the professor explained. Build Right and Green Projects would report their respective shares of the costs incurred and revenues generated from the project. This allows for a more accurate portrayal of each company's financial position. Interesting, Ravi exclaimed. So, 
Joint operations are accounted for differently than joint ventures? Exactly, the professor replied. In joint operations, the parties retain their rights to the underlying assets and obligations for the liabilities. This distinction is crucial for financial reporting. As the class drew to a close, Ravi felt a sense of accomplishment. The professor's storytelling had transformed the complexities of INDAS 111 into a relatable and engaging lesson. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In the bustling classroom of a renowned accounting school, Ravi, a diligent student, was eager to learn about INDAS 112, Disclosure of Interests and Other Entities. The celebrated chartered accountant, known for his engaging storytelling and real-life case studies, prepared to share a narrative that would illuminate this important accounting standard. Good morning, class. Today, we are going to embark on a journey with our friend Ravi here, who has just landed an internship at a prestigious multinational corporation, the professor announced with a warm smile. Let's dive into the world of disclosures. Ravi leaned forward, excitement shining in his eyes. What kind of disclosures, professor? Ravi's new workplace, Global Innovations, has various interests in other entities, including subsidiaries, joint ventures, and associates, the professor explained. According to INDAS 112, it is crucial for entities to disclose information about these interests to provide a clear picture of their financial position and performance. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. How does this work in practice? To illustrate, let's imagine that Global Innovations has a subsidiary called Ecotech, which specializes in sustainable energy solutions, the professor elaborated. As a parent company, Global Innovations must consolidate Ecotech's financial statements into its own, but it must also disclose specific details about this subsidiary in its annual report. Such as, Ravi inquired, Excellent question, the professor replied, pleased with Ravi's curiosity. The disclosure should include the nature of the relationship, the proportion of ownership interest, and the financial results of Ecotech. For instance, if Global Innovations owns 70% of Ecotech, they must reveal this ownership percentage and any relevant financial data, such as revenue and profit contributions. Ravi contemplated this for a moment. That makes sense. So, stakeholders can understand how Ecotech impacts Global Innovations' overall performance. Precisely, the professor said, affirming Ravi's understanding. Let's consider a real-life example involving Tech Corp, a large technology company. So, it's about transparency and accountability? Exactly, the professor exclaimed. For example, if Tech Corp had a joint venture with a startup focusing on artificial intelligence, they would need to disclose not only their ownership percentage, but also the financial implications and any risks involved. Risks? Ravi asked, intrigued. Yes, the professor continued. If the joint venture faced significant challenges or market fluctuations, these factors should be disclosed as well. Investors need to be aware of any potential risks that could affect the overall financial stability of Tech Corp. To further illustrate, the professor introduced another scenario. Imagine Ravi has a friend named Anjali, who runs a restaurant called Spice Route. Anjali recently entered into a partnership with a local farmer to source organic vegetables. If Ravi were to invest in Spice Route, it would be essential for Anjali to disclose her interest in this partnership to potential investors. This would help them understand the sourcing dynamics and any associated risks. Ravi was captivated. So, disclosures help investors make informed decisions? IND, as 112, not only mandates disclosures about subsidiaries and joint ventures, but also covers associates. If Global Innovations had a 25% interest in a startup, they must disclose this association along with any relevant financial data and risks involved. Ultimately, these disclosures empower stakeholders to assess the company's financial health and make informed decisions. Companies that embrace transparency foster trust with their investors, enhancing their overall reputation in the market. As the session concluded, Ravi felt enriched by the storytelling approach of the professor. With a newfound understanding of the importance of disclosures, Ravi was now ready to apply this knowledge in his internship and future career as a chartered accountant. Share, subscribe, like, comment. The esteemed chartered accountant, renowned for his engaging storytelling and real-life case studies, 
was about to unravel the complexities of INDAS 113, Fair Value Measurement. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the concept of fair value measurement and how it impacts financial reporting, the professor announced, his voice brimming with enthusiasm. Robbie's eyes sparkled with curiosity. The professor continued, to help us understand this better, let's follow Ravi, who recently started working as an intern at a financial consultancy firm. In his first assignment, he was asked to assist with valuing the assets of a client who wanted to sell their business. Robbie leaned in, intrigued. The client owned a tech startup called Innovatech, which developed cutting-edge software solutions. According to INDAS 113, these assets must be measured at fair value which is defined as the price that would be received to sell an asset in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. Robbie's team decided to use the income approach for the valuation. What if there is no active market for the asset? Ravi inquired, wanting to dig deeper. Excellent point, Ravi, the professor said, impressed. In cases where there is no active market, IND AS 113 provides guidance on using other valuation techniques. For instance, if Innovatech had specialized software with unique features, the team could use a cost approach, estimating the costs incurred to develop the software while factoring in depreciation and obsolescence. So, the approach depends on the asset and market conditions. In the case of Innovatech, the fair value of their equipment, such as computers and servers, could be determined using the market approach. Great observation, the professor replied. In valuing a business, it's essential to consider both assets and liabilities. If Innovatech had outstanding debts, the team would deduct these liabilities from the total fair value of the assets to determine the net fair value of the business. To drive the point home, the professor introduced a real-life scenario involving a well-known tech company, Tech Galaxy. When Tech Galaxy decided to acquire a smaller firm specializing in artificial intelligence, they had to assess the fair value of the target's assets. Ravi was absorbed in the narrative. What were the results? The results revealed that the intellectual property of the target firm was highly valued due to its potential to generate significant future cash flows, the professor explained. By applying fair value measurement, Tech Galaxy could make an informed decision on the acquisition, ensuring they paid a price that reflected the actual worth of the assets involved. It enhances transparency and helps stakeholders make informed decisions. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In a vibrant accounting classroom, Ravi sat among his peers, eager to learn. Good morning, everyone. Today, we will delve into regulatory deferral accounts and understand their importance in financial reporting, the professor announced, his voice resonating with enthusiasm. Ravi's curiosity peaked as he leaned forward, ready for the unfolding story. Ravi was instantly captivated. What's the significance of regulatory deferral accounts in this context, Professor? As part of its operations, PowerGen must comply with regulations that affect its pricing and revenue recognition, the professor explained. For instance, if the regulatory authority allows PowerGen to increase its electricity rates to recover costs incurred during an extraordinary event, such as a natural disaster, this creates a situation where the revenue is recognized in the financial statements but not immediately received in cash. Robbie's eyes widened as he connected the dots. So, how does PowerGen account for this? PowerGen uses regulatory deferral accounts to reflect this timing difference, the professor continued. In this scenario, when PowerGen incurs additional costs and anticipates that these costs will be recoverable through future rate adjustments, it recognizes a regulatory deferral asset. This asset represents the expectation of recovering these costs from customers in the future, thus aligning with INDAS 114 requirements. Ravi pondered for a moment. Great inquiry, the professor responded. If PowerGen later finds out that the regulatory authority will not allow the cost recovery, the previously recognized regulatory deferral asset would need to be reversed, resulting in an impairment. This aligns with the principle that the accounts must reflect the current reality of the situation. To illustrate this concept further, the professor shared a real-life case involving a large utility company, EcoPower. EcoPower faced similar circumstances when an unexpected storm caused extensive damage to their infrastructure, leading to increased operational costs. 
They recorded these costs in their regulatory deferral accounts, expecting to recover them through a future rate increase approved by the regulatory authority. Ravi nodded, absorbing the details. And how did EcoPower manage the recovery process? The regulatory authority conducted a review of EcoPower's claim and ultimately allowed a gradual increase in rates over several years to cover the recovery, the professor explained. Ravi was intrigued. What about situations where costs are incurred but cannot be recovered? The professor smiled at Ravi's inquisitiveness. In such cases, if the regulatory authority does not permit recovery, the utility company must de-recognize the deferral account, leading to a loss on their financial statements. This ensures transparency and accurate representation of financial health. As the class progressed, Robbie began to appreciate how INDAS 114 allowed entities like PowerGen to manage regulatory adjustments effectively, ensuring financial statements presented a true and fair view. Regulatory deferral accounts enable companies to bridge the gap between accrual accounting and cash flow impacts, the professor summarized. They are essential in industries with price regulation, ensuring that companies can recover costs while maintaining transparency with stakeholders. Armed with practical insights and real-life case studies, he was eager to apply this understanding in his internship, enhancing his journey as an aspiring chartered accountant. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In a bustling accounting classroom filled with eager students, Ravi sat at the front, attentive and ready to absorb new knowledge. The renowned chartered accountant, celebrated for his engaging storytelling, was set to explore the world of INDAS 115, revenue from contracts with customers. Ravi's curiosity surged as he anticipated an insightful story. To illustrate this standard, let's consider Ravi, our keen student, who was taken on an internship at a software development company called Tech Solutions. The professor began capturing the class's attention. What's the significance of revenue recognition in this context, professor? Excellent question. At Tech Solutions, the company enters into contracts with clients to develop software solutions. Under INDAS 115, Revenue must be recognized when control of the promised goods or services is transferred to the customer, which involves a careful assessment of the contract terms, the professor explained. Ravi nodded, trying to grasp the concepts. Can you give us a practical example? Imagine Tech Solutions has a contract with a retail client, ShopEasy, to develop a customized point-of-sale software system. The contract outlines specific deliverables, including the software development, installation, and training, the professor elaborated. According to IND AS 115, Tech Solutions must identify the distinct performance obligations within this contract. What are performance obligations? Ravi asked, eager to learn more. Great question. Performance obligations are promises to transfer distinct goods or services to the customer, the professor clarified. In our example, Tech Solutions has three distinct performance obligations developing the software, installing it at ShopEasy's locations, and providing training to their staff. Each of these obligations must be recognized separately for revenue. Robbie was intrigued. How does the company recognize revenue for each obligation? Let's break it down, the professor said. Upon signing the contract, Tech Solutions recognizes revenue for the software development when it transfers control of the software to ShopEasy. This occurs once the development is complete and the software is installed. But what if there are changes or delays in the contract? Ravi inquired. Excellent point. If the contract is modified, Tech Solutions must assess whether the changes create new performance obligations or adjust existing ones. The professor responded. For instance, if Shop Easy requests additional features that are not part of the original agreement, Tech Solutions must recognize the additional revenue related to those features once they are delivered. To further illustrate, the professor shared a real-life case involving a multinational tech company, SoftTech. SoftTech entered into a contract with a large organization to provide a comprehensive cloud-based solution. Throughout the project, SoftTech encountered several client requests for additional features. They had to carefully evaluate each request against INDAS 115 requirements to determine if these changes resulted in new performance obligations. Ravi listened intently, understanding the importance of accurately recognizing revenue. 
They recognized the revenue for these new features only after the features were delivered and accepted by the client, the professor explained. Robbie was keen to learn about potential challenges in revenue recognition. What if there are uncertainties regarding payment from the customer? Another insightful question, the professor acknowledged. Under IND AS 115, companies must also consider the collectability of the payment. The standard guided companies to recognize revenue based on the transfer of control, enhancing the reliability of financial statements. By understanding the nuances of revenue recognition, Robbie can ensure that Tech Solutions maintains compliance and provides accurate financial information to stakeholders, the professor concluded. He left the classroom excited to apply these principles in his internship, ready to tackle real-world challenges in revenue recognition and contribute meaningfully to his company's success. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In a vibrant accounting classroom filled with eager students, Robbie sat up front, ready to absorb the day's lesson. The renowned chartered accountant, famous for his engaging storytelling, was prepared to guide the students through the intricacies of INDAS 116, the standard on leases, which replaced INDAS 17. Good morning, class. Today, we will delve into INDAS 116 and understand its practical implications, the professor announced with enthusiasm. To illustrate this standard, let's consider our friend Ravi who has secured an internship at a logistics company named Logi Move, the professor began capturing the student's attention. Logi Move specializes in providing transportation solutions and operates a fleet of delivery vehicles. How does leasing fit into this, professor? Excellent question. At Logi Move, the company frequently leases vehicles instead of purchasing them outright. Under INDAS 116, which provides a more comprehensive approach to lease accounting, Ravi needs to understand how to recognize and measure leases in the financial statements, the professor explained. Can you give us a practical example, professor? Ravi asked, genuinely intrigued. Certainly. Let's say Logimove enters into a lease agreement for 10 delivery trucks. Under INDAS 116, Ravi must recognize a right-of-use asset and a lease liability on the company's balance sheet at the commencement of the lease, the professor clarified. Ravi furrowed his brow. Good question. The right-of-use asset represents Logie Moves' right to use the lease trucks during the lease term. Simultaneously, the lease liability reflects the obligation to make lease payments over time, the professor elaborated. Wow, that sounds important. Let's break it down. After the lease commencement, Logi Move will depreciate the right of use asset over the lease term while also recognizing interest on the lease liability, the professor explained. So, each month, Ravi will adjust the asset and liability on the books based on these calculations. Ravi's interest intensified. What happens if the lease term changes or if Logi Move decides to terminate the lease early? Great follow up. Under INDAS 116, if there are modifications to the lease agreement, such as extending the term or altering payment amounts, Logamove must reassess the right of use asset and lease liability. To provide a real life example, the professor recounted a story about a global logistics company called Fleet Solutions. Fleet Solutions faced a situation where they needed to modify their lease agreements due to market changes. They had leased several trucks, but found that their delivery routes had shifted. As a result, they negotiated with their lessor for lower payments and an extension of the lease term to accommodate their new needs. Ravi listened intently. How did Fleet Solutions handle the accounting for this situation? The company evaluated the lease modification in accordance with IND AS 116. They recognized a new lease liability based on the revised payments and adjusted the carrying amount of the right of use asset accordingly. This ensured their financial statements reflected the updated economic reality, the professor explained. Ravi was now grasping the significance of IND AS 116. So, this standard enhances transparency and accuracy in financial reporting by ensuring that lease agreements are properly recognized and measured. Absolutely. Another key aspect of IND AS 116 is that it requires lessees to provide additional disclosures in their financial statements, such as the nature of the leases, significant terms, and the amounts recognized in the financial statements, the professor added. 
The disclosures allow users of financial statements to understand the impact of leases on the financial position and performance of the entity, the professor clarified. For example, investors and stakeholders can better assess the financial commitments and cash flow implications of leased assets. As the class concluded, Robbie felt enlightened by the discussion on INDES 116. He left the classroom with a clear understanding of how this standard transformed lease accounting, ensuring that companies like Logimove accurately reflected their leased assets and liabilities in their financial reports. Robbie was excited to apply this knowledge in his internship, ready to face real-world challenges in lease accounting and contribute positively to Logimove's financial integrity. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In a lively accounting classroom, Robbie was eagerly awaiting his next lesson from the esteemed chartered accountant known for his captivating storytelling. Today's topic was particularly intriguing, IND AS 119, which deals with service concession arrangements. As the students settled in, the professor began to weave a narrative that would bring this complex standard to life. Good morning, class. Today, we will explore IND AS 119 which governs how entities account for service concession arrangements. To illustrate this concept, let's follow our friend Robbie, who has taken on an internship with a company involved in public-private partnerships, specifically in infrastructure development, the professor began. Robbie leaned forward, intrigued. What kind of infrastructure project are we talking about, professor? Great question. Let's imagine Robbie's company, Infratech Solutions, has entered into a service concession arrangement with a government entity to build and operate a toll road. Under this arrangement, Infratech Solutions is responsible for constructing the road and maintaining it for a specified period, after which ownership will revert to the government, the professor explained. Ravi raised an eyebrow. So, how does INDAS 119 apply in this situation? The key aspect of INDAS 119 is that it requires Infratech Solutions to recognize both the construction services provided and the associated rights granted under the concession agreement. At the start of the arrangement, the company would account for the construction of the road as an asset, the professor clarified. Can you give us an example of what this looks like in practice? Robbie asked, eager to understand. Absolutely. Let's say the total cost to construct the toll road is 100 crore rupees. Under INDAS 119, Infratech Solutions would initially recognize this cost as a tangible asset. The company would also need to recognize the right to charge users of the toll road as an intangible asset, the professor explained. Interesting. So, how does Infratech Solutions account for the revenues from the tolls? Robbie inquired. As tolls are collected, Infratech Solutions will recognize revenue in accordance with IND AS 115, revenue from contracts with customers. The company will record the toll revenue as it is earned based on the usage of the road the professor stated. Ravi nodded, starting to connect the dots. What about the ongoing maintenance and operational costs? How does that fit into the picture? Excellent observation. Under INDAS 119, Infratech Solutions must account for maintenance and operational costs as incurred. These costs would not be capitalized but recognized as expenses in the income statement, the professor clarified. Additionally, the company will periodically assess the value of the right to charge tolls, ensuring that it reflects any changes in the estimated cash flows from the concession arrangement. To illustrate the importance of this standard, the professor shared a real-life case study. Consider the city of Mumbai, which entered into a service concession arrangement for the construction and operation of a new metro line. The private partner, Metrocorp, undertook the construction and was granted the right to operate the metro system for 30 years, collecting fares from passengers during this period. Ravi listened intently, captivated by the example. What accounting challenges did Metrocorp face under IND AS 119? The challenge arose when Metrocorp had to determine the fair value of the concession asset. They had to estimate future cash flows from fares, consider the expected maintenance costs, and assess the risks involved. As per IND AS 119, these estimates must be updated regularly to reflect any changes in economic conditions or operational assumptions, the professor explained. Wow, that sounds complicated, Ravi remarked, processing the information. Indeed it is. 
This highlights the importance of accurate financial reporting and the need for robust internal controls to ensure compliance with INDAS 119. Furthermore, the standard requires transparent disclosures regarding the nature of the arrangements, significant terms, and any risks associated with the concession agreements, the professor added. As the lesson came to a close, Ravi felt enlightened about the intricacies of IND AS-119. He understood that service concession arrangements are not just about infrastructure, but also about the accounting implications that come with them. With practical examples and real-life cases, Ravi felt prepared to tackle his internship challenges head-on, ready to apply his knowledge to the world of public-private partnerships and their accounting intricacies. Share, subscribe, like, comment. In the heart of a bustling city, Ravi was once again seated in his favorite accounting class, eager to soak up knowledge from his renowned chartered accountant instructor. Today's topic was IND AS 120, which addresses the accounting for government loans. The professor began with a story that would vividly illustrate this important standard. Good morning, class. Today, we will dive into IND AS 120, focusing on how entities should account for government loans. Let's follow our friend Ravi as he navigates a real-world scenario in a company he interns for called Ecotech Industries. This company specializes in renewable energy projects and has recently received a government loan to support its initiatives. The professor began drawing the students in. Ravi perked up, intrigued by the idea of renewable energy and government support. What type of loan did Ecotech receive, he asked. The government offered Ecotech a soft loan which means it has favorable interest rates compared to the market, making it easier for the company to fund its solar power project, the professor explained. Under INDAS 120, Ecotech must recognize this loan in its financial statements, and how they do this is crucial. Ravi leaned forward, eager to learn. So, how does the accounting work? The first step is to recognize the loan at its fair value on the date it is received. If the loan carries an interest rate that is lower than the market rate, Ecotech needs to calculate the difference between the fair value of the loan and the cash received. This difference is then recognized as a government grant, the professor clarified. Interesting. Can you provide an example to illustrate this? Ravi requested. Certainly. Let's say Ecotech received a loan of 50 crore rupees with an interest rate of 2%, while the market rate is 5%. The present value of the loan, discounted at the market rate, may be calculated, and suppose it comes to 45 crore rupees. The difference of 5 crore rupees is recognized as a government grant, the professor explained. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. And how does Ecotech account for this grant? The company will recognize the grant as income over the period of the loan, matching it with the related expenses incurred to generate the income. This means that if Ecotech uses the loan to cover operational expenses for the solar project, it would recognize the grant in the same period as those expenses, the professor continued. Ravi looked thoughtful. What if Ecotech fails to meet the conditions of the loan? How would that be handled? That's a critical point. If Ecotech fails to comply with the terms of the loan agreement, such as not using the funds for the intended purpose, the government may demand repayment. In this case, Ecotech must recognize a liability for the amount to be repaid, which could lead to significant financial implications, the professor warned. To make the lesson more tangible, the professor shared a case study from the recent news. Consider the example of Greenwave Technologies, a startup that received a similar government loan for its wind energy project. Greenwave initially recorded the loan and recognized a grant as described. However, they faced challenges in meeting project milestones due to unexpected delays. Consequently, they were at risk of losing the grant. The company had to carefully monitor its compliance with the loan conditions to avoid repayment issues. Ravi listened intently, captivated by the real-life scenario. What lessons can be drawn from Greenwave's experience, he asked. First, it's crucial for companies like Ecotech to have robust project management and monitoring systems in place to ensure they meet the loan conditions. Second, Transparency in reporting the financial implications of such loans is vital for stakeholders, the professor replied. As the class wrapped up, Robbie felt a sense of clarity regarding INDAS 120. The combination of storytelling and practical examples had illuminated the complexities of accounting for government loans.
Armed with this knowledge, Robbie felt prepared to tackle his internship challenges. Understanding the importance of accurate financial reporting and compliance and securing the support that drives innovation in the renewable energy sector.